I always talk about ancestry and then I talk about all cancer risks, right? When I'm taking a family history, I say, what's your personal history of prostate cancer? And if you have a personal history of prostate cancer, you're meaning a father, uncle, or brother. So first degree relative. Father, uncle, brother. brother. Okay. The number of individuals and the age that they were diagnosed, and we'll put a link in the show note for the table, it increases your full risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer significantly. It doesn't mean you need to change, you shouldn't have a prophylactic prostatectomy, but you should just have intensive, intensive monitoring. Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Ted, awesome to uh, to be sitting down with you to talk about all things prostate uh, related. Uh, it's been probably four years since we did this. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. So um, I think probably it's worth assuming that there are a lot of people who didn't hear that first podcast and those that did probably don't remember much anyway. And also a lot has changed in four years. So um, I think never a bad idea to, to sort of start from the beginning. Um, so let's start with talking about what the prostate gland is what it does uh, before we get into any of the pathology associated with it. Yeah, so the prostate's an exocrine gland and it's part of the reproductive system. It sits just below the bladder in men. So it's a dimorphic organ. It does not exist in women. It develops in utero or in response to fetal androgens. And so um, it produces basically most of the components or about 50 to 60% of the components of semen. So it's used in reproduction in all mammals, and we're a mammal, so we use it too. And um, I guess when you th sort of think about um, things that start to go wrong in the prostate, uh, I'm guessing that most men listening to this, the first thing that they might think of is, you know, prostatitis, uh, certainly in age-wise, right, before you get into prostate cancer, which of course we're going to talk at length about. Um, so... When I think, when, just as a lay person thinking about the prostate gland, I sort of think about inflammation, infection. I think about benign enlargement that leads to obstruction. And then obviously we'll talk about neoplasm. Is that how you sort of think about the problems associated with it? It's, a, it's an organ that sits in line with the urinary tract. And, it, and so the urinary tract in men has a dual purpose. The general urinary tract is a dual purpose. One, it's used for reproduction. The other is used to kind of eliminate all, all the urine. And so... Because of that shared functionality, um, you, can, you can develop problems in one or the other of those two disease systems, um, and they result in symptomatic issues. And a lot of the problems that men, even at a young age, but particularly as they age, will experience are related to the prostate. So in some ways, it's kind of the nexus of the lower urinary tract. So yes, it's absolutely true that in younger men, you can develop infections in the urinary tract. They can be very problematic and difficult to solve and address if it's involving the prostate. Additionally, if you develop an infection, classic bacterial or potentially viral or other kinds of causes, you can get inflammation in the prostate, which can result in long standing, long-term pain. So that's one of the things I see when young men come in with prostatitis. Then as men evolve and age, as the prostate evolves and changes as we get older, um, different issues arise and they can result in an impact um, your urinary function because it's a shared kind of, it's a shared uh, system of, uh, of elimination of semen and of urine. And so as we get older, 50, 50, 50 to 60% of men at age 50 and, 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 and older will have, you know, issues with lower urinary tract dysfunction. Mm. And those almost always directly relate to the prostate in some way or another. So um, some, of the, some of the stats are pretty staggering. So at age 50, it's probably 50 to 60% of men have lower urinary tract dysfunction. But by age 60, it's 75 to 80% of men will have lower urinary tract symptoms. So let's talk about what those are. Typical ur lower urinary tract symptoms, weak stream, uh, hesitation or slowness in getting your urinary stream started, urgency to go to the bathroom, increased frequency to go to the bathroom. And they're related to two things. One, functional obstruction, functional obstruction of the urethra. That's the tube that we urinate through, uh, the tube that comes out of the tip of the penis. And that tube 
the first part of it passes right through the middle of the prostate. So as the prostate enlarges, it can compress that channel and that can result in weak stream. It can result in dribbling and straining. Additionally, the muscle behind above the prostate is the, is the bladder. The bladder is a, is a, a, a bag, a, a storage device that is, is muscular. And so that muscle, as the, uh, as the diameter of the tube narrows with in increasing size, for example, that muscle will have to work harder. Compliance will go down. And when the, the compliance of the bladder goes down, the capacity can go down. And the increased urgency to go to the bathroom will go up because it's less stretchy. So again, as we get older, the prostate, parts of the prostate will grow. Oftentimes that growth of the prostate results in narrowing of the channel. That can concomitantly lead to thickening of the bladder wall. And then that results in a whole constellation of urinary symptoms, which can be managed. Uh, but many, many men have them. And it's certainly something that we talk a lot about with almost all of our patients. So maybe let's talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> what the medical management is for those things, because um, this is an area where the surgeon does both the medical management and the surgical management, right, typically? Yeah, urologists are, it's one of the more unique specialties in that we do a lot of diagnosing and then managing medically and treating surgically and then survivorship for almost all the conditions that we take care of. So what are the first steps in the medical management of lower urinary symptoms? Yeah, so behavioral modifications. So um, if you're an executive at a water company and all you do is drink water all the day, all day long, you're gonna urinate a lot. So a, a lot of it is just education and behavioral modifications. So educating people that a lot of what you take in will come out. That, you know, that the idea that you know, the kidneys are designed to maintain our bodies fluid status and a kind of homeostasis. If you increase your fluid intake, you're going to have increased urinary output. And so just basic educational things about that is really, really helpful. In addition to regulating what you drink, it's when you drink it and what's in what you're drinking. So a lot of people will come and, and, and come in with symptoms of nighttime urinary frequency. And a lot of that is just, you can modify with education saying, Hey, don't, you know, don't drink, you know, two glasses of water right before you go to bed. And if you get up in the middle of the night because you have to urinate, don't drink another glass of water right when you get up to, to urinate. So, so that kind of component of the education timing of when you take in those fluids and then what's in the fluids, specifically caffeine. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some fluids that have natural diuretic properties. And so if you are taking or drinking a, something that's a diuretic, you're gonna produce more urine and that will result in more urinary symptoms within two to four hours after taking that fluid in. So caffeine, for example, uh, is a natural diuretic and it will cause you to produce more urine over a certain amount of time than you would have if you, didn't, if you took in uh, iced tea with no caffeine in, for, in, it, in it, for example. So a lot of educational things, a lot of, um, a lot of um, education about what to do, when to do it. We often will have people do voiding diaries, um, but really it's a diary of what you're, what you're drinking and then when you're urinating. And actually just having the patients just walk, that, walk through that with them will, will be quite helpful. Right. So they're measuring their input in exactly. timing and, and volume yep. and output in timing and volume. Yeah. And that simple task, which is you know easy, easy to do, will result in A, a realization that, hey, I'm drinking you know, 130 you know, ounces of water a day, like what, you know, and it's, it's all excessive, it's unnecessary, because you can show them that, yeah, you're urinating out the same basic amount of volume, because we also get in our foods, obviously water too, or, or fluids. So, so mapping out, mapping out kind of behavioral modifications is the first step I always do. If it persists, and they're bothered by it, then we'll talk about doing avoiding diary, particularly if their symptoms are a little bit unusual. For example, if you're sensing that there may be urinating much more at night than you would anticipate after they've done these different behavioral modifications. There are hormonal, hormonal, um, you know, uh, hormonal uh, deficiencies that can result in increased urinary production at night, for example. So if we're suspicious of any of those things, or if patients are still bothered by their urinary symptoms and they, um, they're, they want to not go on a medication. We'll do avoiding diary. We'll map out when they're drinking, when they're urinating, and then we'll kind of go from there. Now, now what, what if a guy comes to you and, and is sort of upset about the frequency with which he's waking up to pee at night? The medical term for that, of course, is nocturia. Is there a norm? 
right? So you and I are 50 years old. Um, I would say five nights a week, I don't get up to pee. Two nights a week, I get up to pee once. Yeah. And obviously that's probably more tied to the timing of my fluid intake and what it was than you know necessarily prostate specific symptoms. But what's normal if there's such a thing as normal for a 50 year old, a 60 year old, et cetera? Yeah, great question because there's a lot of variability in terms of what you can expect based on on the age of the individual. So there are there's a there's a naturally secreted hormone, antidiuretic hormone, and it in younger decades of life it has a, a surge of release around seven or eight o'clock at night. Antidiuretic hormone prevents you from diuresing or producing more fluid. Alcohol, by the way, inhibits this hormone, which is why alcohol before bed is a great recipe for having to get up and pee for two reasons. You get the fluid yes. in the drink, yes. and then you get a molecule that inhibits the release of antidiuretic yeah. hormone. Absolutely, and, and so the classic one for that is beer because it's a higher volume, high volume, high, high volume yeah. Uh, intake. So yeah, so you, we have natural diurnal release of antidiuretic hormone, and that diurnal variation is attenuated kind of per decade as we get older. Mm. So that peak of antidiuretic hormone goes down per decade. And that can then kind of normalize your 24 hour urine production. Whereas when you're in your 20s or 30s, you would produce, let's just say 80 or 90% of your urine during waking hours. During the nighttime when you have high levels of antidiuretic hormone, you're not going to produce as much urine and your kidneys and your body will save that extra fluid for the morning when you get so, up. So is there a biologic explanation for the attenuation of that hormone as we age? You know, it's a good question. I don't know the, I don't know the answer that to, as to why that could be, but certainly we see it in general in aging populations, men and women. Yeah. I see. So, because I did, I, after we had got through this, I wanted to ask the exact same set of questions yeah. around female symptoms. Yeah. But so right now you're saying there's an equalizer. Both men and women experience this reduction yes. in, uh, and yeah, in, in, in antidiuretic hormone as we age. And then there are other factors that are also similarly consistent among aging individuals, male or female, like the resiliency of the tight junctions in your capillaries and uh, uh, your vascular system, right? So it's, you know, less resilient and less tight as we get older, right? So you have, even if it's subtle and not fully appreciable, you have some capillary leak. And as you lie down when you're sleeping at night, you know, that fluid will leave the extracellular space into the intravascular space and your kidneys will read that yep. as increased fluid. So, you know, I'm a very, I have a very focused urology practice, but when I have people with urinary symptoms, I try to do a, f a really full body assessment because one of the main drivers of uh, nighttime urinary frequency, or one of them at, that's particularly tracks with age is you know just peripheral edema. So are you are you developing edema and so forth? So meaning people who have a lot of peripheral edema at the at, in nighttime you get uh, basically reversal of some of the third spacing. Yes, and it's almost like they have an IV drip that's yeah. taking fluid from yeah. the interstitial space into their vascular Completely. space. It's like they're drinking at night. Yeah. So one of my behavioral modifications, it's not really behavioral, but non-medical modifications is, you know, knee high TED stockings for people who are having symptoms who, if I see them at eight or nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, they had any edema, any kind of ringing around their socks or something like that, then I definitely strongly encourage them to, mm, to, to do that because it, it, you know, I tell people, if you're getting up twice a night and you have a little bit of edema, you do some behavioral modifications, we can reduce your nocturnal urinary frequency by kind of one. So you can go from two times a night to one time at night just by changing when you drink and wearing TED stockings. And that's a, it's a, maybe not true for everybody, but it certainly encourages people to do simple things without doing the polypharmacy. The other thing that um, is a main issue related to nocturnal urinary frequency is sleep apnea. And I'm sure you've talked mm. a lot about sleep apnea on a variety of your different uh, your shows. It is a driver of a lot of just bad pathology. And one of them is nocturnal urinary frequency. And it, and we'll talk about it later, but in the post-prostatectomy space, it can actually result in profound nighttime urinary incontinence. Mm. But it will produce a really sy symptomatic, profound uh, nocturnal urinary urine production and nocturnal urinary frequency in individuals. Have and why is that? 
It's, I think it's also related to the, the regulation of your anti-diuretic diuretic hormones. And um, huh. really there's profound, you know, whole body side effects from it. So, you know, in many ways, if there's a, there's a subset of men who, um, this is a good way to encourage them to get their sleep apnea A diagnosed and then treated. Okay, so so that's so that's behavioral. Yeah, that's, so so then let's talk about the pharmacologic tools. So you've already kind of alluded to one, and it's one that we use in our practice, um, which is when we have a guy who otherwise we don't have a clear explanation for why he's getting up to pee, um, and he doesn't appear to have a particularly enlarged prostate, and we can, we're going to talk about, of course, all those things. A very low dose of desmopressin, which is this, I get, is the synthetic version of the antidiuretic hormone, uh, typically 0.2 2 milligrams before bed, uh, has profound effects. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about that and then maybe some of the other things. And, and also, are there any contraindications to the use of that? I know certainly theoretically a contraindication or a concern would be hyponatremia as you would sort of increase uh, plasma volume uh, and therefore dilute sodium. But maybe just talk a little bit about how you would use that. Yeah, so there, there are very straightforward, you know, frontline medical management um, Med, uh, you know, pharmacologic agents to manage lower urinary tract symptoms. And generally speaking, the frontline ways that we manage it would be with an alpha blocker. So there are, um, that's a, a, a class of compounds that are nowadays very, very specific to prevent activation of um, a set of smooth muscles that are really isolated mostly in the prostate and somewhat in the seminal vesicles. And so if you just take a step back and look at the embryology of the prostate, it obviously is a, um, it develops from ep urogenital the urogenital sinus, and there's mesenchymal and epithelial components of that. So there's a lot of smooth muscle within the prostate. The smooth muscle exists within the prostate in part to help with ejaculation. Mm -hmm. It's a, effectively like- It's like a pump. It's a pump. So yeah. once you have, when you're having an orgasm, the, the pump squeezes, the prostate will squeeze, and that will result in emission of the fluid. So what you can do for individuals who have lower urinary tract symptoms is that while you have this channel, this tube going right through the middle of it, that's the urethra, the urethra yep. you can relax the smooth muscle within the prostate and that will relax a little bit and, and theoretically it enhances the diameter of the, of, the, uh, of the prostatic urethral channel. That's the thought for how it works. And that could then result in relaxation and improvement in urinary symptoms. And it works quite well for most people. Now, originally this was noted because of the kind of first class of, of, of alpha blockers were used for blood pressure control. And so one of the side effects of the first generation of these medications was just profound hypotension until you kind of titrated up the dose and so forth. But the more modern, med more modern ones um, really effectively treat specifically the uh, so they're selective in that they relax those muscles without dropping yeah. blood pressure and and the newest generation of ones will actually be more are even selective to the smooth muscle within the prostate and not the seminal vesicles so the seminal vesicles and the prostate kind of grow up right next to each other for example when you do a radical prostatectomy you take out both organs they're attached to each other the mm -hmm. seminal vesicles dump into the prostatic urethra so the second generation, third generation um, anti-muscarinics, or I'm sorry, alpha blockers would paralyze or prevent contraction of the prostatic smooth muscle, right? So you would have improved urinary symptoms, but would also have decreased- It doesn't impede ejaculation. It would, they would impede ejaculation. The, the kind of, the first more targeted ones would. Yes. Because they, they would in fact- Paralyze both. Paralyze both. Yep. The newest generation of- um, the newest classes of these uh, of these medications really focus only on prostate, and so the impact on volume of emission of seminal emission or or semen is actually much less impacted. And so I usually will just reach for those; they're great. So what are, what? How many of those are there out on the market today? There's there's three. Typically today, you would only use these third generation alpha blockers. What what are, what are they what are they called? What yeah. are the names of so these drugs? Alfuzacin is the uh, one I usually go to, but there's another uh, you know third three point five generation medication called Sildenafil. Rapaflo is what that's go goes by, and then Alfuzacin goes by um, 
uh, I don't know, alfuzacin and sildenafin are the two newest medications that are third generation that result in less impact on sexual dysfunction, specifically less impact on semen production, but have really, really outstanding uh, uh, efficacy in terms of relaxing the prostate and improving urinary symptoms. Got it. Now, when I was in med school, and I remember doing urology rotations, and even in residency doing urology rotations, a common drug that was used to treat this was um, a drug that blocked the conversion of testosterone to DHT. So Proscar was yes. the name of that drug. Uh, the, the brand name of that drug, Finasteride, was the the generic name. And, um, I, you know, we're going to talk, I want to come back and talk about Finasteride specifically so we can punt on the discussion of, of that syndrome that we're going to discuss. But strategically, whether we're talking about finasteride or dutasteride, drugs that block the conversion of testosterone to DHT, which again, we'll bracket for a moment that we'll come back and explain why. Are those drugs still in use today to treat this particular condition? Yeah. So there are specific indications where you would think about utilizing a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor for men with lower urinary tract symptoms. It's second line. Okay. So if you have uh, urinary symptoms, you've kind of failed behavioral modifications, then we would do an alpha blocker. If an alpha blocker is working, um, but not to the extent that the patient's satisfied, and the individual patient has a large prostate, over 70 or so grams. And that you can easily diagnose that on an ultrasound or MRI. Yes, you, you would typically you know uh, be able to size that, no problem. Can, can a good urologist size that on a rectal exam? A good urologist can. I personally kind of think about things like small, medium, large. Yep. In general, for people in a relatively high quality urology practice, you're going to know the patient's volume of their prostate based on a variety of things you're kind of monitoring yep. for. But if you have a large prostate and you're having progression on an alpha blocker, you can reach for a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, finasteride or dutasteride, and they have been shown to reduce the likelihood of urinary retention and reduce the need for surgical procedures in prospective randomized trials. But in general, they're recommended for really the big beefy prostates. Mm -hmm. But remember the symptoms uh, that they would treat, that is they result in the, the, um, the decrease in the kind of size of the prostate by between 20 and 30% over the long haul. It doesn't happen immediately. When you take an alpha blocker, you feel better within a week. When you take a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, it will take six plus months to mm -hmm. A, feel better, B, see the size reduction in, your, in, your, in the prostate. And then, of course, most importantly, you'll have an impact on the PSA levels in the serum. And so it's critical that patients are aware that your PSA it's numbers are artificially will, depressed. It's, I mean, it's, you could be masking pathology potentially. Is that yeah, the concern? Yes, the PSA value will decline because PSA is a androgen regulated product. And so when you reduce the amount of that potent androgen, you'll reduce the value of PSA. It goes down by about half. So it's a very, um, it's a useful drug, but it is not something that I usually reach for because it requires a lot of very active monitoring, has limited effect, limited kind of, uh, you know, efficacy in my opinion. And, um, and, and there's a downside we'll talk about. There's a lot of potential issues that one can experience while taking it. So I'm very cautious about doing that. So for me, I reach for an alpha blocker. If the alpha blocker is working in terms of improving the kind of outlet obstruction symptoms, that's strength of the stream, how fast can you empty, but patients still have a, a significant um, urinary bother, increased urinary frequency, urgency to go to the bathroom, then you can either do a, a anti-muscarinic or an M3 agonist, which is the newest class in that kind of category, which really helps relax the muscles in the bladder and really significantly impact the um, symptomatology for people with those kind of predominantly what we would call storage symptoms. You can have obstructive symptoms, alpha blockers are great for those. You can have storage symptoms and- And storage symptoms are frequency? Frequency, urgency. Just think about it. Yep. If you have a thick if bladder- If the bladder's impeded. The compliance yep. is poor, it doesn't stretch well, it's hard, it's just always kind of um, feels full, then those are things that can be very nicely addressed with these agents. The anti-muscarinics are 
dangerous or you need to be careful when using those because in aging individuals, they can they are associated with worsening of dementia and other kinds of neurological cognitive wow. um, you know acuity. So the M3 agonists, which is is has the same net effect, um, are much cleaner. So let's much less side effects. And so and the antimuscarinics were just older drugs. They were, yeah. and it was the first line. So the the, the M3. so we kind of put those in the same category as maybe the five alpha reductase inhibitors, which is it's. Yeah, that's right. You always look for a better option first. Um, are women as susceptible to urgency and frequency from the same underlying pathology? Obviously, women, when they go through menopause, estrogen withdrawal alone can produce those symptoms, and there the treatment is clear. It's estrogen replacement. Yeah. Um, so given that women don't have a prostate and therefore don't have something abutting their bladder in the same way... Um, is there a role to use these uh, M3 agonists in yeah. their frequency and urgency symptoms? Yeah, I mean, most of those medications and the prescription frequencies is much, much higher in women. So that would be the kind of classic overactive bladder. Got it. And so women will have bladder symptoms that are also similar in men. The men have, uh, have uh, you know, a thousand to one more often, you know, obstructive symptoms because the urethra in a woman is very short. It's four centimeters long. The urethra in a man is, you know, 25 centimeters long on average or something like that. So the obstructive symptoms are much more prevalent in men. And so that's why frontline is always an alpha blocker. But if they're having a good response with an alpha blocker, um, but still bothered, uh, you can reach for a, an, a, uh, an M3 agonist. For me personally, though, it's always a balance because at some point you have to start saying, well, okay, how old is the patient? How significant are their symptoms? Because there are highly effective ways to manage these issues surgically. These days they can most of the time be done just as a simple outpatient. Yep. And so then you start saying, I, I usually begin to introduce the idea of, okay, well, if you're still bothered, we have outpatient surgical procedures that can basically fix this for life with no medications. And so I'd that's kind of my stepwise process that I kind of lead patients through in terms of thinking about their urinary symptoms for men. Let's talk about let's talk about the surgical procedure. So again, yeah. just kind of going back to my where I what I learned about twenty five years ago the the TERP right the transurethral yeah. resection of the prostate. Yes. Uh, uh, kind of a rotor rooter job. Yeah. So the prostate develops from the urogenital sinus. The uh, prostate, as we mature in response to androgens and estrogens too, for that matter, will it develops into different zones or different regions. The peripheral zone, which is outlying the prostate, think about a orange and the orange peel, and the pulp of the orange is a transitional zone of the prostate that gets bigger. Actually, it's not just a testosterone-driven thing. It's actually when there's more estrogens around that actually with mm -hmm. testosterone that can result in hypertrophy increasing in the size of the transition zone. That is what causes all the urinary symptoms in individuals. With rare exceptions with an aggressive cancer, that's what's causing it. In those situations, you can do what they call, there's a variety of missed procedures, so minimally invasive surgical procedures that can address um, these urinary symptoms. So you can do a variety of things. You can introduce steam into the transitional zone tissue, that can then you know kill that and effectively kill all the smooth muscle and reduce to some extent the kind of hypertrophy of the epithelial cells. You can surgically resect it. You can transurethrally. Transurethrally, so okay. no incisions. So yep. what we would you could call a natural orifice procedure. Uh, you could suspend it surgically. So there's kind of tethers that you can put in place that kind of tent open the urethra. Uh, but the mainstay, the gold standard, is to remove the tissue, uh, which can result in profoundly improved urinary symptoms. It is, and, and is that done with like laser electrocautery? I mean, what is yeah. the gold standard today for the 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 means by which you remove the tissue? So, the gold standard has always been the TERP procedure, which is what you described. Now that procedure itself has evolved in that it can now be done with irrigation that is with normal saline. So pr traditionally, to uh, maintain a monopolar current, you had to use water because you would not want the sodium to disrupt that current. Mm. So now a modern TERP is a bipolar TERP. A bipolar 
where you have you you the the, the explain to folks why you need an irrigant when you're doing this yeah. procedure. So you're effectively, um, as you described it, this is a kind of rotor rotor procedure, but you're technically removing bulky tissue in the urethra that's kind of circumferentially surrounding the prostatic urethra. Yeah. So you you sort of have as you know you've got this thing here. And you, you, using the natural orifice of itself, you have to expand the diameter of this thing by actually getting rid of yes. prostatic tissue in the transitional zone. Yes. Yeah, so you scrape out small portions, usually one or two gram size little scoops of tissue. You do that with effectively a hot knife. It's shaped like a loop. So you kind of core out little loops of tissue. And when you do that, you A, have bleeding. Yep. And B, the tissue collapses on you. It's like uh, it's like a cave, so it keeps falling in on you. So you have to suspend it open with the irrigant, and you have to use the irrigant to better visualize what you're doing. That's a traditional terp. That was always done with water. And when you did it with water and you were tenting open the tissue, putting it under pressure, you could have water move into the intravascular system. And you could get something called post-TUR syndrome, which is basically where you made the patient profoundly hyponatremic. You diluted their sodium too much, and that's very dangerous. Yes, and you'd have significant neurologic issues and so forth. So that particular procedure, and there's lots of kind of advances in urology in this particular space. That procedure, 15 years ago, they started basically redesigning the devices so you could do it with saline. So therefore, if you were in, if there was flow of fluid from the procedure into the intervascular space, you could, it was it's just like safe. giving them intravenous fluid, it's like that's isotonic. Them, exactly. So that really prevented the, um, that prevented any issues that you could have with this TUR syndrome. And TERP is a very effective, and it remains the gold standard that all these new MIST, these minimally invasive surgical techniques compare themselves to in terms of efficacy. Now I have the pleasure of having a partner at Northwestern, Dr. Amy Crambeck, she has in my we've, we've actually sent a couple patients to yeah her. amy yep. is amy does a procedure called holep which is a homium laser enucleation of the prostate so the terp basically is is effectively scraping out little one gram chunks of tissue so if you have a hundred gram prostate you'd have to scrape out let's just say your goal is to get that down to 50. your goal is to get it down to 15. 15 so even less than like normal we would say might be 30 right uh, yeah, so normal prostates increase in size as we get older. So the, a normal prostate for a man who's 40 or 50 is between 20 and 30. Yeah. But people can have profound urinary symptoms with prostates that are as small as 35 grams. So people often assume because you have urinary symptoms that you actually have this gigantic and large prostate. That's not always true. But the smaller prostates typically can be well managed with medications, and only we, will we be moving to surgical treatment when the prostates get larger. So you've got sort of a selection bias going on. You there. do. So frontline gold standard historical is TERP. It's now a bipolar TERP, so it can be done safely. And the reason you go from a hundred, if you're starting there, down to fifteen as opposed to thirty or forty, is you want to be one and done. You never want to be back again. Yes, a good. A, a good surgical procedure is effective for life. Now, they're not all like that. And so the ones that, the less tissue you remove, if you don't remove any tissue, for example, you're more likely to have a secondary treatment. Okay. My partner, Amy Crambeck, is really one of the pioneers in modern whole up surgery. So this is different. So again, if you think about the orange analogy, a TERP or any of those other procedures is basically trying to scrape out the pulp one, one little chunk at a time. Amy will go in and she'll get in the, the plane between the peel or the rind of the orange yep. and she'll and take, take out all the, the pulp, take up. it all out in one piece. She pushes it into the bladder and then there's a morse later that then chomps it into little tiny pieces that you then remove through the urethra. So there, the the benefits of whole. So just let's make sure people understand that because I love that. I think that I think your orange analogy makes this so much easier to understand. Yeah. If you're doing a terp, you're sticking a pen. You've got a pencil hole going through the orange. Yeah. You got to put that. You got to put a hollow pencil into that pencil hole and literally one tiny tiny thimble at a time. Yeah. Pull out little sacks of pulp. Yes. One by one by one by one by one by one by one. Yes. 
Additionally, remember that when you're doing that, you're disrupting the kind of architecture of the orange. Yep. And there's lots of blood vessels that exist within the transition zone itself. Yeah. And it, so it's now it's it bleeding ble like a sieve. Bleeds a lot. Yep. When when Dr. Cranbeck, when Amy does her procedures, she gets in that natural she tissue. She into that natural plane, and it's not bleeding as much. And yes. she somehow manages to take that whole pulp minus the peel shove it into the bladder, and when it's in the bladder now, isolated, you can break it apart. Yes, and she'll morselate it apart. So she'll, she is spectacular. So um, HOLEP was a procedure developed, originally described in New Zealand, I believe by a New Zealand neurologist. And it was limited for a long time based on the technology that existed within the lasers. But um, the laser technology, and Amy really helped develop the latest versions of these lasers that are just higher energy, more precise, Take that, and then you can then, you know, couple that with an experienced surgeon. And the outcomes for it are spectacular. So, and what are the what are the um, patients who would not be considered candidates for that procedure? Is there a is there a contraindication to that? No, if you're talented enough, you you can do it in anybody, which she can. Now, the smaller the prostate, the less distinct there the the differentiation is between the peripheral zone the the skin of the orange, the peel of the yep. orange, and the pulp. And so it actually requires more skill to do a whole lep in a smaller gland than in a bigger gland. When the prostate's really, really big, the adenoma is very well formed and it's easier to get into that plane. Mm -hmm. So a large prostate would be something over 80 grams. That's where you'd really say, in, in let's say a general urologist practice, the threshold for doing a terp like procedure goes down it's really long to do a TERP. It takes a long, long time to do it. Yeah. If you're a talented whole lab surgeon, you know, Amy can do a 200 gram prostate in about 20 minutes. I mean, she's spectacular. Tell me about what that patient goes through uh, post-procedure. They go home that day, obviously. It's an they outpatient go home, procedure. They, they, have a, go, they have a catheter in place? No. No catheter? Yeah. So that's the other thing I remember, Ted, from when we were yeah, little different. spring chickens yeah, is, yeah. How many, the, the catheter management on yeah. that patient with a blood bag full of bloody water yeah. and urine coming out for yeah. days and days and days. And again, it's a relatively small price to pay, I think, for the ultimate relief you're going to get. But how, how is it that this patient just literally leaves the office yeah. without a catheter? Yeah. So it has to just do with, you know, what you do at the end of the procedure. So how well you're controlling the bleeding. And the, I think the big difference in hold up, as I mentioned, is when you're in that distinctive plane it between separates adenoma perfectly. and peripheral zone, you, it's just the vessels are much more discreet, whereas in a TERP, there's these sinuses and so forth. So, but yeah, so the, the analogy, again, to the orange is perfect, right? Yeah. If you try to peel an orange from the inside, ripping apart, uh, yes. you're going to get it's orange juice all over your hands, whereas if not, you're taking the skin off, it's actually... It's less elegant. You remove less tissue. It's bloodier, et cetera. So big picture, if people... Um, are on medication and they have progression, you can start talking about minimally invasive surgical procedures. There are in-office minimally invasive procedures and there are, they're quick. The, in general, a take-home message though is the, the less you do, the less durable and less effective it is over time. So there are procedures where you can tent up mm -hmm. the, the yeah, prosthetic urethral channel. They work with basically temporary relief, I would only even consider those in individuals who could not tolerate the medications. But why would you, if you're gonna to go to the trouble of actually putting a probe in the urethra yeah. to go through the tenting up procedure, why wouldn't you just do the procedure Amy does? I, I, I do, I'm just saying for your general audience that may be offered for somebody, I, don't, I never recommend I it because it never works, it can cause a lot of pain. You put these clips and you're tethering things up, it prevents an effective, high-quality MRI. There's lots of limitations, but people may who listen to your show may be offered these things. So it's called Eurolift. Yeah. Then secondary or next step up would be to basically use steam to ablate the prosthetic cells. When you do steam, you're, you're killing and just desiccating the cells, and that can result in pretty good symptomatic relief. By the way, do, do patients require general anesthesia for this? I've forgotten. No. For the Eurolift, you can do it in the office. For this procedure called Resume, you can do that in the office with local anesthesia. It's uncomfortable for patients, but it can be done there. Okay. Or it can be done under like, you know, uh, twilight. Yeah. Um, that works. It is a step more in terms of 
intensity and what you feel, those individuals go home with the catheters, lots of edema and lots of swelling when you do that procedure. So they require a catheter for several days to a week. Right, because that steam creates inflammation, even though it's cauterizing. Yeah. And if you don't leave that catheter in, they're going to get urinary obstruction. They're, they're not going to close be able to their exactly. Yeah, urethra. So resume would be the next step up in terms of a, in, invasiveness. Then you can always go to this traditional bipolar terp or bipolar terp. That's all. Those are all effective therapies to think about or talk about with the patient when your prostate's less than, let's say, seventy or eighty grams. Holep was originally developed to just handle the bigger prostates, which traditionally you and I, when we were training at Hopkins, we would do an open, simple prostatectomy. That's where you open the patient up from above, just below their belly button. You open up the bladder and then you manually with your finger kind of carve out that inner pulp of the orange, leaving the peel of the orange behind. And the reason you leave the peel behind in that procedure is because it's not a cancer, you don't need to risk injuring the neurovascular bundle on the outside, yeah. which is obviously what we're going to talk about when we get to prostate cancer. Yeah. Everything around the outer um, peel of the orange is all the important you know, real estate. So the urinary sphincter muscle and all the nerve tissue that goes to the sphincter and also goes to the cavernosal bodies that trigger erections. So when you, that was what we used to do. Now that procedure is evolved. That can be done minimally invasively with a robotic procedure. Um, and that was really kind of emerging as a standard of care. And then the peop, you know, super talented surgeons like Amy Cranbeck came along and can do a 200, 400, 600 gram prostate. How, how, first of all, can you just show me what a 400 <laughs> gram prostate looks like? A like 400, physically, what is 400 that? gram prostate's a large grapefruit. I mean, it's massive. What's amazing to me is. Whereas a normal prostate is a golf ball. Yeah. So a normal prostate is a golf ball. An orange would be 100 grams. A big grapefruit is 400 grams. That used to be a procedure that was technically very difficult to handle with an open, simple prostate, robotic, simple prostatectomy. Amy Cranbeck can, you know, do do three of those in a day and be done by noon. She's, you know, so it's spectacular. A couple stuff. of other just questions on the on the the size of that prostate. So when a guy has a two to 400 gram prostate. How much of that is genetic? Is that virtually all genetic? Yes. A lot of the, you know, you see that a lot where it runs in families. So what it is that is underlying that overgrowth, um, you know, not well studied. Frankly, should the NIH be putting their research dollars behind like why do men get big prostates? Probably not. So, uh, but yes, definitely runs Is there runs any in correlation families. with prostate size and cancer? Yes. When you talk about Inverse those correlation. So the bigger the prostate, the less your chance of developing aggressive cancer is. Why is that? Not sure. Um, and it, it may have to do with variations in the balance of hormones, for example. There's definitely a um, large prostates in, in grow in response to kind of a, not an increase in testosterone actually, but, but a, a more of an even ratio of T to E, so testosterone to estrogens. So Actually, as your testosterone declines, as you know, as you get older, the, the T can go down. Estrogens remain pretty stable or can go up, obviously, with metabolic Especially if you have met metabolic, metabolic, syndrome, metabolic syndrome, estrogen so, will rise. So as men age, their prostates grow, and I believe that that's more hormonal. So, In other words, if you're saying that, you know, again, classic thinking that has clearly been proved false is that testosterone is causing prostate cancer. You're saying it's way more nuanced than that. And it's maybe if the endocrine component of prostate cancer may be more related to the relationship of testosterone and estrogen yes. and a declining testosterone in the presence of a rising estrogen would be a more favorable endocrine milieu for prostate cancer than the younger phenotype, which is higher testosterone to estrogen. Well, let's just take that back a second. So when you're, t when you're, as you're aging, your testosterone and you, let's say as you're aging and if you have metabolic syndrome, your testosterone levels will go down, your estrogen levels will go up, and that can result in prostatic growth, but it's typically more adenoma growth in the transition zone causing lower urinary tract symptoms. So benign so, growth. Benign growth. That somehow is protective, either the, the size or just the ratio, that difference in ratio of T to E is somehow protective for developing kind of later onset prostate cancer. Remember, in my mind, you know, you're, you're locked in and, and your code is, is effectively set in stone in your 30s and 40s, in my opinion, for, for development of prostate, prostate cancer. cancer. 
Wow. Right. When your estrogen levels are very low, your T levels are higher. Now we'll talk a lot about testosterone and what it's doing in prostate cancer later. But in my opinion, um, it's the T to E ratio that attributes to, uh, is responsible for prostatic enlargement much more than the development of any prostate cancer. And just to kind of close the loop on the surgical procedures for lower urinary tract symptoms, two, two final thoughts. One is, what is the floor for the, uh, what's it called, the whole? Holep, homeum, whole laser, and nucleation of the prostate. So what, what is the, in the hands of as someone as talented as Amy, what is the smallest prostate she would do that procedure on? Somewhere on, let's just call it 25 or 30 grams. Oh, wow. So basically, there's and no limit in the hands of a talented surgeon. She does hole-ups on anybody who needs a surgical procedure. That's her go-to technique. Okay. It, now, re- below that, there's not a lot of transitional zone tissue. So the yeah. other key take-home message for the listeners are if you develop, if you're developing profound urinary symptoms and you have a small prostate, you have to start looking for other sources. And, and by definition, you're not responding to two classes of drugs. Yes, you have to worry about cancers, not prostate cancer, but you have to worry about urothelial carcinoma. Urothelial carcinoma, which is a cancer in the lining of the bladder, but also- Can even get into the urethra. It, yeah, it, the urethra has urothelial lining. Mm. Oftentimes people, particularly young women will it's a classic kind of board exam. You know, young, younger woman comes in with urgency, frequency. You neglect to look at their urine for cancer cells, and they can have a, 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 a lining, a, a cancer in the lining of their urethelium that's causing all those urinary symptoms. So I see. So, so small prostate, unresponsive to medical management, young age, persistent symptoms. You better be doing urinary cytology. In my opinion, you need to do a workup to rule that out for sure. And there can be other, you know, central nervous system. Uh, you know, diseases that can result in urinary symptomatology. But in general, as a urologist, you have someone coming in with those symptoms. You really want to start understanding, well, what else could be going on? Because as we mentioned, you may have, those individuals may have had a history of prostate infection, like a bacterial infection, or may have had a viral infection. They can result in prostatitis um, and inflammation in the in the yep. in the uh, pelvic floor itself, and that can result in all those Absolutely. symptoms. And so, the, so yes, you can have as your kind of canary in that coal mine that you have urgency frequency, but it's not at all attributed to a large prostate. It's not attributed to drinking too much fluid. If you if you take away the attribution of a urothelial carcinoma, then you have to start saying, well, what are the other causes? And there's a lot of uh, potential issues that can be addressed uh, that can cause that inflammation that has uh, unknown etiology to what incited it, causing that urgency, frequency, urinary yeah. bother. Now, given the success of this procedure, I mean, obviously Northwestern is probably top five urology um, institutions in the United States. Uh, approximately, would you? How many people does every city have an Amy? Like, is what's the frequency no. of surgeons of that skill? I would say that in the U.S., uh, well, I'm biased. I yep, think there's only sure. one Amy out there, but there's very few people who are as talented as she is. I would say that there's probably 10 whole lab surgeons that are on her part. At her level. They could yeah. basically go all the way down to a 20, 30 gram it's prostate. Not the, it's not the small prostate. Yes, it requires a lot that, of skill to do the small amount. prostate, but handling, um, handling these very, very large prostates in individuals who are incredibly frail and older who were told, look, you're too old for a surgery. I was just on call uh, a couple weeks ago, and we had a 95-year-old gentleman came in from another major hospital in the in our city, who was having bleeding from their prostate that was more than one unit of blood a day transfusion. What? Yes, and was told we can't do anything for you. You're too old and you're too frail. So I go around in this guy on a Saturday, Amy had done a whole up, it was a hospital, a hospital transfer, quaternary care to quaternary care center hospital, right? Just so it speaks to her skill level. Transfer in, she does the whole up, it was a 450 gram prostate. She takes out 400 grams of tissue and the guy, we left a catheter in him because you know we just weren't sure. We took his catheter on a Saturday morning, he went back home at 90, age 95. Wow. So amazing, like really a talented yeah. surgeon like Amy, and there are other Amy's out there, but talented surgeons like Amy, which are hard to find, really can transform people's quality of life. Let's, before we get into some of the pathophysiology of how the hormones impact the prostate, 
which is a good lead in, I think, to, to cancer. Let's go back and talk a little bit about prostatitis because I, I would guess that for many men, that is their first brush with pelvic floor discomfort and, uh, you know, a symptom associated with, uh, with this gland. So, so I, I remember, you probably don't remember this, but I remember having a brush with this about six years ago. And of course you, you helped me out. And so what, this is part of the problem when you start to play doctor to yourself, right? So all of a sudden I start having some, you know, discomfort when I'm peeing and, um, you know, I, I do all the usual stuff. I, you know, check, oh, is it an infection? Da, 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 da. None, none of the above, right? Yeah. So it's not like I have a urinary tract infection or, you know, an STD or anything like that. Um, and boy, does it, and it's not unbearable pain to be, I don't want to, I don't want to over dramatize this. It's not like razor blades are coming out, which I've heard people describe, you yeah. know, that might be certain infections. No, 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 it's none of that. It's just not comfortable. It's yeah. really uncomfortable to yeah. void. And, um, I, I gave you a call. I remember exactly where I was when I called you, by the way. And and you were the one that said, no, 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 look, you know, and you started asking me a bunch of questions. Hey, you've been traveling a lot. Are you a little constipated? And one thing led to another. And the diagnosis in your mind was, look, playing doctor over the phone, at least, I'm actually more likely thinking this is prostatic inflammation. Yeah. So walk us through the the pathology of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I wish I could tell you in, in the next uh, five minutes what the pathology was, because we the, the short answer is we do not know. We call this kind of constellation of symptoms, chronic pelvic pain syndrome. So what that really ends up meaning is it's a bucket that you really, we put a lot of different things into. So you can have pelvic pain and discomfort if you have a, a large prostate and it's obstructing your urinary tract. Okay, that one we talked about, you can manage that. That's pretty easy to do. But there are other things that can cause pelvic pain and discomfort. One would be an acute bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. And that's a classic. Frankly, if we find that, I feel good because I know we we have a solution. We can address it and so forth. You can address the infection. Now, the inflammation and the discomfort and pain that results after that may take much, much longer to resolve. You can have a a, a non-bacterial infection inflammation that could be viral although no one's really ever isolated specific viral Mm. viruses that are you know an individual man tracks with that pain but viral and then there's pelvic floor you know dysfunction that is outside of the urinary tract that pelvic floor function could be in the in the anus and in the rectum having to do with dysfunctional voiding or elimination in the rectum it could have to do with dysfunctional elimination between the bladder and the u- urinary or urethral sphincter. Those are common in yeah, kids. Yeah, because the other thing anatomically that maybe we failed to mention was the proximity of the rectum to the prostate. Yeah. So the rectum and the prostate are adjacent to each other. Yep. The rectum and the prostate effectively develop from the cloaca. The cloaca is the embryonic kind of sewer. That's where all the waste in a fetus would go into and out of. And then it's divided anteriorly and posteriorly into the urogenital sinus and then the, what becomes the anus and the rectum. And so, yes, they're, they're, intimately, um, they're intimately associated with each other and the innervation between the two of them is actually, there's a lot of cross innervation. So if you have inflammation in the gut, in the rectum and in the anus, you can result in irritation and inflammation in the prostate. There also can be translocation of bacteria between the rectum and the prostate. So when we when we are talking about your individual yep. situation, I said, are you traveling? Are you constipated? We think that that can result in maybe some increased transmural translocation of bacteria. But in and general- by the way, to this day- We don't really know what yeah, it was. But, but that said, like any, for reason, I, I go to great lengths to make sure my bowel habits are regular when I travel. It's yeah. still difficult. Like it's yeah. like I'm out of routine. I don't know if it's dehydration. I don't yeah. know what it is. Uh, it, it also might be parasympathetic, sympathetic balance. I think yeah. there are lots of reasons why yeah. a lot of, most people I talk to, you know, as patients, obviously I don't have this discussion at parties, but, but we'll say, yeah, I just get constipated when I travel yeah. a lot. That almost always seems to produce some change in voiding quality. 100%. So there's a huge correlation. Number one, it's just physically the pressure on the prostate and, and, and so forth can just make it much more difficult. So the classic, the classic presentations for a man with um, urinary retention, um, obviously post-procedural. So if you have a hip or a knee, mm-hmm. anesthesia can shut your, your gut down and you can get constipated yep. and you can do that. Or um, you know, some of the different, um, 
cough and cold medications can can do the same thing. But in general, I, th- I think of travel, constipation from changing in your bowel function, that will be a, a big one. And even if you doesn't make you, frankly, um, go into urinary retention, it affects how you urinate and, and, and so forth. So so let's say you rule out the common stuff. Yes. Your father wrote a very important paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. Has it been 20 years now? Say 15 years ago, okay. yeah. Um, that I refer back to that paper quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and it was actually following the algorithm of that paper that when I got back to New York from when I, back in whenever this was going on, circa 2016, that um, we went through that diagnostic procedure. Yeah. Walk through that procedure, which again, I think for most people seems like a lot, it's a, that's a long run. But when you're dealing with something so complicated, um, it is important to get some diagnostic specificity because the treatments do differ. Yeah. And once in my case, the treatment was identified, the fix was on. Yeah. So the, there's a workup that you can do, you implement if you're concerned about or worried that someone has an infection in their prostate or potentially their seminal vesicles that you would have to go through to distinguish that type of infection from an infection in the bladder, which is right next to the prostate. And so that is, basically uh, was described by a Stanford urologist, Tom Stamey. And that effectively um, was that you would capture urine as it comes out the urethra in different phases, and therefore you could track where that urine came from. So it's actually a a four-step process. So the first step would be to capture urine immediately after you start voiding. That would then capture and wash out any bacteria within the urethra. The, the long channel between the bladder and the tip of your penis. Right, so that first few cc of urine that comes into the... It gives you a sense for, is there any bacteria growing in the urethra, a urethritis? Yep. Then the second phase would be, um, you would wait a, a couple seconds and then capture urine um, midstream coming out from the bladder. This is, you know, if, and then you could then determine, is there an infection in the bladder? Yep. Then what you would do is you would tell the patient to pause. You would do then a a rectal examination and you would press on the prostate. Pressing on the prostate vigorously so that you could effectively in some ways replicate what what happens in an orgasm. That is where the smooth muscle squeezes the fluid out of the prostate. When you do a vigorous rectal exam, you're trying to push the fluid into the urethra. You can sometimes just actually capture that prostatic secretion by itself. We call that EPS or expressed prostatic secretion. You can send that off for an evaluation for any bacteria in it. That is not always the case that you can get um, you know, that fluid out. So then what you would do is to send the patient back to the washroom, have them then capture urine coming out of the urethra and the, the kind the of final? The, the, the beginning of the flow okay. right after a vigorous exam. That okay. will capture the fluid that may be still in the prostatic and the other parts of the urethra but it was in the prostate. Yes, got it. And that would be the kind of essence of the step. And then you can just kind of complete the void. So then, therefore, what you can do is look for where are the cultures showing any bacteria. And the cultures that would be, let's say, for example, clean in the initial void, that would be VB1, the initial void, and clean in VB2, that would be the bladder. But having bacteria in the EPS, the prostatic fluid itself, or, or VB3, VB3 yeah then that would tell you that there's an infection within the prostate. Now, the key thing uh, is that standard labs will call an infection if they see bacteria that's growing more than 10 to the fifth. So more than 10,000 plus bacteria in that sample. But if you're worried about having an infection in the prostate, for example, you need to lower that threshold. Threshold more like, are you having hundreds or thousands of bacteria? So it's 10 to the two or 10 to the three. So whenever because that we, should be a completely sterile. It should field. be completely sterile. The bacteria is a host. The prostate is a hostile environment for bacteria to persist. It's very acidic. It's actually thought when people say, well, "Like, well, what's the point of the prostate?" Right? It's used for reproduction, but it's also thought that it can be somehow a barrier to developing an infection in a man uh, in the bladder. So the the hmm. the hostile acidic environment of the prostate is thought people speculate to somehow prevent a bladder infection. Because remember, pre-modern medicine, if you as a man would develop an infection in your bladder, it's life-threatening. Yeah, especially if it goes up to the kidneys. If it goes into the kidneys or it goes into the blood, 
you get urosepsis and you uh, often will die. So people think, okay, what's the prostate for? Well, it's used for reproduction, but it's also maybe used for helping to prevent as a bar natural barrier for bacteria to go all the way Do to the Do women butter. have any such thing? I mean, women are so much more susceptible to UTIs they don't, because of the short urethra. Yes, they're, they're susceptible to UTIs. But remember, if you have an infection in the bladder of a woman, yes, it can also track to the kidney. But in general, this, there's limited stasis of urine in a, in a woman's bladder because the urethra is so short and you can evacuate or empty the bladder so effectively in a woman. Whereas in a man, as you get older and your prostate gets larger, you don't empty you all the way, you can retain stasis urine. stasis of urine in the bladder. If you, have, if you retain urine that's infected with bacteria, you are, you are gonna. So women, so all things equal, women are less likely to develop urosepsis or uh, uh, you know, kidney infections based on the fact that they're more, it's easier for them to evacuate the bladder if there's an infection. It's by age, by decade. Yeah. Right. So young men, they're the least likely to get any urinary tract infection, period. But as men get older, their chances of developing a urinary tract infection equal that of a woman. But you could argue because of the urinary stasis, et cetera, that that infection in a man is much more life-threatening early on in their disease course than a woman. The, the probability that you would develop an infection in the kidneys is probably the same between a man and a woman. But remember, if you have a man who's older, who has a bladder infection, that can go into the blood, but it also can go into the prostate. And as we were alluding to in our discussion of working up somebody for a prostatic infection, clearing an infection in the prostate is very, very difficult and very challenging. So you have to do this specific STEMI four glass test. That's the different phases of the urinary voiding. You have to rule out that there's any infection in the prostate. It's rare that we would pick that up, but it's possible. And the other place that you want to look for in the kind of very unusual cases is in somebody who has maybe an infection in their seminal vesicles. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can put a picture up for the, for the audience, but the seminal vesicles, they produce about 50% of your semen. You can get a bacterial infection in your seminal vesicles. And unless you're looking for that infection, you'll never, you'll never clear that person because it's kind of very isolated from any continuity of the urinary tract, but can result in pelvic pain, can result in persistent issues of the infection. Yeah, one in, of the, oh, go ahead, in, sorry. I would say in general, we do that very specific test to rule out infections in the urinary tract. Um, that are related to the prostate or the seminal vesicles. The other way you could do it, a poor man's version, is to actually send off a semen for uh, a bacterial testing. We like to do this, this uh, you know, express secretion kind of setup, but you could do that too. If you have an infection in the prostate or in the seminal vesicles or the genital tract, then yes, we know how to treat that. It's with directed antibiotics. That in many ways will address the infection and most of the time address the pain and discomfort that's associated with those symptoms. Now, the issue is that there are, are many people who have discomfort that is not associated with bacterial infection. It could be viral, it could just be inflammation. And it's not necessarily within the urinary or genital tract. So I see a lot of patients, and when I do a rectal exam on somebody who's complaining of, of, of uh, prosthetic pain, I always wanna feel the muscles in the pelvic floor. And just like- And how do you do that on the rectal? Is it just a broader exam? So when you do a rectal exam and you feel kind of straight posterior, you're yep. feeling just the prostate. If you just move your finger laterally- You're into the pelvic floor for you're sure. You're in the pelvic muscle for sure. Yep. And so oftentimes you won't feel much of anything. Yep. But in a man who has pelvic pain syndrome, I, I feel all the time, like at Meaning least- Meaning it's just locked up? It feels like a guitar string. Yeah. You'll feel bands of muscle. So, you know, think about when you when you tweak your traps. Yep. You have those bands of muscle that you can feel with your hands. But the good thing about that is you can go get a massage and you can work it out. And and that same thing happens in the pelvic floor muscles. So when I'm dealing with the patient who has chronic pelvic pain syndrome, or pelvic pain, I should say, maybe not chronic, but oftentimes we'll see them after a while of this discomfort and pain. I try to be I try to treat their symptoms based on where the where the pain is coming from. So is it prostatic? If it's prostatic, I try to do things like, um, you know, alpha blockers, uh, potentially Cialis is another one to treat the symptoms that are associated with that discomfort. If 
I pick up that they have a lot of tightness in their pelvic floor, I send them for myofascial release. So it's transrectal yep. myofascial release. It sounds barbaric, but no, it no, is but a I've, game changer. I've seen this make like change a guy's life. Hundred percent. And so I feel and great. the same for women. Yes, true. Yep. So I feel you know um, great when I can when I if I'm examining somebody and they have that, it makes me feel good because I have a solution. The ones that are difficult are the ones that we just don't know what's causing it. Can be related to food too. So if somebody has pelvic discomfort or pelvic pain, you do a very thorough kind of diary of what they're eating. And, and it's more classic in women with what the kind of female equivalent of this would be interstitial cystitis, mm. where you'd say, well, what foods trigger it for you? Because it can be triggered and irritate the bladder, and that's causing the pelvic discomfort. So again, you, you take a thorough history. The NIH has a very good online questionnaire to help you kind of tease out where the symptoms are coming from. Then once and you, that's that's under NIH's website, or is it under yeah, specific? If you Google N NIH chronic pelvic pain syndrome, questionnaire we'll, you'll we'll get link it to that in the show notes and then, then and then you can take it and you can delineate that and so yes is it common in young men no but it's more common for if a young man's seeing a urologist to have that than let's say bph or something obviously the most common thing for a young man to come see us for is ed but yes it's definitely something that we can address and i've seen a number of men who go through the diagnostic workup there is no infectious agent whatsoever, but yep. simple prostatic massage, yep. uh, just like you describe as a, a massage to an, you know, an ailing muscle, alleviates the problem. It's, it's, an, it's a very anti-inflammatory yep. process. Yes, that's, that's a great point. So A, why that works for some people, we don't know, but it works and hey, we'll take it. The other classic thing I hear about, and, and you, you, you know, you'll hear about it in medicine is, um, well, I have chronic prostatitis, Again, that's a that's a very specific diagnosis. It's a bacterial infection that you can't clear, so it's almost impossible to have that. But I have chronic prostatitis, and I take an antibiotic, and I'll go on 30 days or 60 days of this stuff, and it makes me feel better. That scares me a lot because, as you know, going on anything like a potent antibiotic has a lot of downstream consequences yep. that you just got to be careful of. Changing your gut flora, tendon, you know, all these different issues. Why is it that they work? And if you ask the patient, they'll say, as soon as I get this discomfort, I'll take a Cipro, I'll take a Levoquin, I'll take a Bactrim, and I feel better. It's because these powerful antimicrobial agents, these anti antibiotics, they are profoundly anti-inflammatory too. So if that's what they're telling me, I try to transition them out of popping these, you know, month long runs of antibiotics and get them on an anti-inflammatory. Yeah. So strong, non Is there a particular and said that you find works better or is it like does celebrex even work even though it's you know i don't find it to be necessarily as potent as yeah you know i try to stick with the more potent ones and i think naproxen is what i like it's bid dosing it can be a little hard on your stomach but i find that to be you know ibuprofen is incredibly potent but it taking the right dose three times or four times a day can be hard yeah. so i use what about meloxicam do you which one i haven't i haven't you know okay. gone to it but it, it theoretically should work and people you know there have different sensitivities or yeah. efficacies with these different ones so i start i start generally with naproxen and i'll do that with a little bit of an an anxiolytic because some of the anxiolytics help just relax the pelvic they relax a lot of your muscles and they'll help relax the pelvic floor muscles because although you want to treat that particular symptom it's causing inflammation in all the structures around it rectum bladder prostate and pelvic floor muscles so i usually will try to do that for a limited time i don't like people taking long-term antibiotics for it unless yeah. they have a difficult infection. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I have a friend who I sent to you recently in that boat, right, where kind of has prostatitis, you know, or believed to yep. be bacterial prostatitis once a year. And that sort of triggered my thinking that maybe that's not what this is. And, yeah. and maybe we need to go down a different path. So now there are individuals who, you know, we can't put our finger on what's causing the symptoms, but my father still has an active research lab. He is the world's authority on kind of prostatitis and pelvic pain and one of the things he's, and he's still at northwestern he's still at northwestern he has an ongoing clinical trial for people he can pick up uh he believes that a lot of discomfort and pain has to do with mast cell dysfunction and so he'll actually do he has a clinical trial where he'll actually see individuals he'll do an uh, eps he'll look at their voided uh fluid he'll assess them for different markers for mast cells 
if they're high, he'll put them on mast cell inhibitors in a clinical trial, and it's quite effective. So if folks are interested listening to this, uh, presumably this is a trial only for men, of course, um, where can they find more information about the trial? Yeah, on the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine under the Department of Urology's webpage, my father and his um, Anthony Anthony Schaefer. J. Schaefer and Praveen Tumbakat are the he's my my father's scientific partner. They okay. are working so we'll on this. we'll link to that yeah. as well for folks who. Are so there is in that hope trial. for these individuals because there is a subset of men we do see that it really is sad because it has a huge impact on the quality of their life. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked now at length about two of the big problems associated with the prostate. And while both of these can be an enormous threat to the quality of a man's life, um, they're, they're not often a threat to the length of life, though I guess one point I'd make before we leave these is one of the questions I get asked a lot is, how does somebody actually die from Alzheimer's disease? And, you know, what I usually explain to people is, they usually don't die from Alzheimer's disease. They usually die from something else that is brought on by the Alzheimer's disease. And one of the classic sad, tragic cases you see is urosepsis. Yeah. So you see a, a man with Alzheimer's disease and he is simply, so one, he might have a catheter in him because he's unable to void on his own and that dramatically increases his risk. But even if he doesn't, He's simply less responsive to the signs of an infection. He's not attentive to the fact that it's burning when he pees. Mm -hmm. And because of his age and his immunologic reserve, what starts out as a urinary tract infection on day one is a lethal case of urosepsis yeah. on day four. And so, you know, I do think of this as kind of one of the grim reapers uh, of, of older men. Yeah, I mean, um, as men age, and particularly if you have, con you know, concomitant other significant medical issues, your frailty goes way up. And so any little insult to your body can do it. And obviously classic things are aspiration, aspiration, yep. pneumonia. The smallest cellulitis if you're not moving around. Exactly. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and so, so I think it's a lack of awareness and, and absolutely it requires a very astute kind of caregiving family or, or cohort of individuals to notice subtle changes because obviously if you can pick up an infection early, then it doesn't necessarily have to spread and it won't be so symptomatic. If you could speak to someone listening to this who's caring for an elderly patient, male or female, who is in the throes of dementia, what can a caregiver do on this particular front? Is there anything they can do to minimize the risk of a kidney infection or a bladder infection turned into systemic sepsis. Is there anything they can do? Yeah, good hygiene is obviously key. Uh, and I think in general, um, if you're monitoring the individual, uh, they're, they're voiding, you know, uh, they're voiding history. So we, we obviously would prefer for people to void on their own. And many people can, many times people have catheters in place for convenience of the caregiver. Right. And so if you can keep hardware out of somebody, that's obviously very effective. And if you if the individual can't void and they're having trouble with that, then intermittent catheterization is what we obviously endorse and recommend where you just place a catheter temporarily and empty intermittent the urine. catheterization poses less of an infectious Absolutely. risk than constant catheterization. A little counterintuitive, right? You would think, gosh, if three times a day you have to cath somebody, that's three times you're introducing it. But you're saying if it's done with Dwell perfectly time. sterile technique. Dwell time, right? So yeah. three times a day for 60 seconds each for, so that's 180 seconds versus 24 seven for yep. the bacteria to be there. And we know if you leave a catheter in place by 48 hours, the, the bacteria has crawled, They've colonized the crawled up the, the tubing and is in the bladder. So yes, if you can minimize the dwell time of the foreign body, okay. the better. So yes, it is a little counterintuitive, but for men and for women, if you can do intermittent catheterization, that's a profound way to reduce the chances that you develop any you know, urosepsis. Will you develop or will you have bacteria in the urine if you do intermittent catheterization? It's possible. Does that mean that you failed with that technique? No, because if you're continuously emptying the bladder, you never can get overgrowth and you can never get enough urine with bacteria in it to cause or pose a problem. And, and that, that leads to another point, which I often see, which is in individuals as they're aging, you know, I think dehydration is a key underappreciated contributor to all these medical conditions. So remember- yeah, Especially because older people lose their 
r relationship between thirst and hydration status. That that's another one of those things that yeah. Deteriorates and if you have Alzheimer's, age. you forget yep. to drink, frankly. And so, if you have bacteria in the urine, but you keep the concentration at ten, you know, ten bacteria per mL, well, that's not going to be a problem. But if, if you're, you're dehydrated, dehydrated and you have more concentrated urine and there's more, the same amount of bacteria with less urine, then you're going to have you could really have significant issues. So. Yeah, I mean, it's very, you know, the, you know, as we age and you have these comorbidities, a good caregiver is critical. And that's the, you know, oftentimes in medicine, they're paid the least, you know, and it's really an important role that you have. So I think if you can maintain any kind of hardware in an individual, get them out walking around and just remind them to drink. If they have a catheter, you want to get that catheter changed every month or three weeks. And generally, mm. A good caregiver and a good urology practice. We have a whole team of nurses that do this for our, our cohort of patients. Um, they'll get an idea of the cadence for that individual, but we try to stay away from it if at all possible. Okay, so Ted, let's 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 kind of put those two aside and now pivot to the third uh, major source of pathology associated with the prostate, which is prostate cancer. So, so prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death uh, for men, uh, behind only lung cancer. Um, and so in order, right, it goes for men, uh, it's, it's lung, prostate, colon, pancreas. Um, the thing that kind of stands out to me is we have great tools of detection for prostate cancer. And based on that, I guess it's a little surprising to me that it is still the second leading cause of cancer death in men. So one of the things I hope to be able to do by the end of this final part of our discussion is get a better sense of what an individual can do to flip the odds in their favor. Because you've probably heard me say this before. I don't think anybody should ever die of colon cancer right. for the same reason. We have remarkable tools of detection and, um, and we also have a very predictable pathogenesis where we must go from a polyp. We must go from an adenoma to a carcinoma. Yes. And we can detect the presence of the adenoma because it is outside the body effectively. So just to bring it back old school to where we first met, obviously that would be the Halsteadian theory for how cancer would spread, right? And that would be a stepwise from a localized non-invasive to an invasive tumor to a regionally advanced and then metastatic. metastatic yeah. And colon follows that algorithm pretty well. There are obviously always, you know, the cases that you can't, you know, the, that, that are yeah, sure there are sessile polyps but, that are very difficult to detect. And but like that. in general, I would say that, yes, I agree with everything you're saying. And I would agree that on average, prostate cancers follow a similar Halsteadian spread. Halsteadian theory of spread, as opposed to Bernard Fisher and the Fisherian spread, which I think which is, is the breast cancer breast model. Cancer. Yep. Exactly. So yes, 100% agree with you that prostate cancer is on average um, 250 to 260,000 new diagnoses this last year. So a lot um, will follow a, a uh, more of a Halsteadian spread. Now remember, um, if you keep that in mind and you're the math guy, not me, if you do this, just model it, 250 to 260,000 new diagnoses, 34,000 deaths. So yes, on average, we are picking up cancers, but on average, if you look at the ratio of cancers diagnosed to cancer deaths, that ratio is pretty It's favorable. much better yes. than the other cancers. That's right. Conversely, to put pancreatic cancer in terms like that, of the people diagnosed with adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, about 95% of those people will experience lethality within five years. Exactly, so we have that in our favor. Yes. And so yes, what keeps me up and gets me up in the morning and excited is to understand and identify what it is about the individuals who develop prostate cancer that is you know, localized and you know, does it have a lethal potential? And how do we better attack those subset of individuals that will ultimately die from their prostate cancer? So lots of progress, even since when we last talked. But yes, big picture, it is still a real issue. Okay. We've already touched on um, testosterone. We touched on estrogen. We peripherally discussed dihydrotestosterone. Let's explain how androgens work where are androgen receptors? What are these hormones doing? And for the purpose of this discussion, how do they factor into the pathogenesis of this condition? 
Yeah. So if you go back, and I actually think it's a really good exercise for for an individual um, to go back and understand where the prostate actually comes from. It comes from the urogenital sinus. This is a sexually dimorphic organ. And in the response to androgens around week 10 or 11 in a developing fetus, human fetus, there's a surge of testosterone from the gonad. And that surge of testosterone results in the development of this ductal network. It's an exocrine gland and it develops in, out of this structure. And it turns out... By the way, how big a surge in testosterone? I know that it's much more significant than the levels that a little boy is born. A little boy is born with very low testosterone, but he did experience a lot of it in utero, right? Yeah, lots in utero, lots in, in really at birth, and then puberty. Those are the three yeah. peaks. And they're... Um, Similar, I think, to obviously, puberty is the highest, yeah. um, but it's enough to impact a change. And we'll talk a little bit about that because it's not just testosterone levels, of course, that matter, but it's what what the intracellular dihydrotestosterone testosterone, levels yeah. are. So in the urogenital sinus, the mesenchyme, those are the things that eventually turn into muscle and kind of connective tissue. They contain androgen receptors that then send a paracrine signal to the epithelium. Let's even back up for a moment and make sure people understand this. So testosterone, complicated molecule derived from testosterone, uh, derived from cholesterol. Yes. So picture a cholesterol yeah. molecule with all of its rings. Testosterone is very comparable. Wh what is an androgen receptor? Explain what it is and where it sits. Yeah. So the androgen receptor is a, um, it's a very fluid molecule that basically um, sits in the cytosol of a cell. And in so this, outside the nucleus, outside the nucleus, and the androgen receptor is a transcription factor. So it turns on a variety of different uh, genes within a cell. So think about when in your house, if you have a circuit breaker and you turn on the circuit breaker and every light in the house goes on, that's what a transcription factor does in, in my mind. That's how I think about it and explain it to pa patients. Androgen receptor is a transcription factor and needs to be in the nucleus of the cell to flip those switches. And it sits in in the cytoplasm, and it can, it needs to translocate to the nucleus, and then bind to the DNA of our cells to have its effect. And it only does that once testosterone or dihydrotestosterone binds to it That's in the right. cytoplasm. So it signal it, it has a conformational change that permits it to enter the nucleus when it's bound to testosterone or dihydrotestosterone. Now dihydrotestosterone has a much stronger, higher affinity for the androgen receptor and enables it to be, it's about 10 times more potent. So one molecule of DHT is the equivalent of 10 molecules of testosterone. Now that conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone does not occur anywhere in, in your body. And just for the listeners, by the way, women have an equal distribution of androgen receptor as do men, okay? But they don't typically have androgens around. Now, to add one more layer of specificity. I mean, they have, I guess, let's do the math. A woman will have probably 5% of the androgens, right? Yes. She'll have about 5% of the testosterone that a man will have. But theoretically, at birth or in utero, they have the equal distribution right. of, of androgen receptor. Yep. And they don't, but they don't have dihydrotestosterone. Okay. So they, men have 5-alpha reductase in their hair follicles and in their prostatic tissue predominantly. Those are the two main areas where it exists. So if you have the same amount of testosterone floating around in your blood, um, it will have one effect, let's say, on your skin because it is never converted to, to DHT. Um, but if, if that same testosterone molecule hits a hair follicle or hits the prostate, it's converted into a very potent androgen um, DHT through 5-alpha reductase. And that can then have a much more potent effect in terms of the subsequent you know, uh, effect of the, of the androgen receptor. So just to make sure I understand, um, if, if, if a, if a male has a normal testosterone level, yes, but he's taking a five alpha reductase inhibitor, which yes. we, we want to, I want to talk about that now, which lowers the conversion of testosterone to DHT. And this is Young guys will take this all the time to prevent hair loss. These yes. are the most common yep. drugs that are used to prevent hair loss because the part of the story, I guess we didn't finish here, was DHT uh, in the hair will damage the follicle. Yeah. It's, it's leading to yeah. baldness. Early death, yeah. Yep. So, so it seems to me like he's shortchanging his androgen receptor potential. He's, he's shortchanging the ability to 
experience testosterone. It's almost like he's taking a testosterone haircut without taking the testosterone haircut. Yes, what you end up with is less intraprostatic DHT, more intraprostatic T actually, right? Because you can't convert it. So you're pulling it in yes. there. You normally would convert it. That's true in the hair follicle also. But as we'll talk about, because there's, there's significant pathology associated with taking finasteride. And so we, we used to think that it was predominantly in those main structures, follicles of your hair, prostate, et cetera. But now we know it actually has, there's profound potential impact of of that neuro you know centrally in your nerve system right and it can affect your sex drive it can affect your sex performance etc so so let's talk about this because i had never heard of this until a few months ago post finasteride syndrome yeah so we talked earlier about finasteride when it's taken in a drug called proscar five milligrams a day it has a cousin called dutasteride or avodart i think that's yeah. 0.5 milligrams per day yeah that one theoretically is more potent because it blocks five alpha reductase one and two. Okay, but but their effect, the efficacy is equivalent in the human body. Okay, and then lower dose finasteride, so not five lower milligrams. dose. One milligram per day is called Propecia. Yeah, and that's the branded version that's used for hair loss. Yes. Okay. The first thing I remember you telling me about this was, it's a little bit of a scam that these drugs are taken daily because their half-life is quite long, right? Yeah, they all have a very long half-life. So if you took a single uh, finasteride five milligram dose, it's generic, so it costs nothing anyway. Yeah. But if you took that, it would hang around in your system for a week or two. <laughs> okay. So so the idea that, that you know, the reason it was reformulated at one milligram versus five milligrams was for a new patent, new indication. Yes, of course. Uh, but you could take, you. I, I haven't worked it out. You could probably just take a single five milligram of finasteride once a week, and that would be the same as one milligram of the other stuff every day. It's, it has a much longer half-life than anyone appreciates. Um, and uh, it's, you know, that's the least of the problems that I think is yes. associated so with let's this drug. Get to, let's get to the issues, because this is also a very controversial topic, right? There are people that get up in arms on both sides of this discussion. So describe what post-finasteride syndrome is. Well, it, it's a variety of symptoms that men will complain of after taking either, you know, uh, the BPH dosing or the kind of hair loss dosing of these medications. Decreased sex drive, impotence, um, and ejaculation. Um, inability to ejaculate. Inability to ejaculate. Depre more so those are obvious and apparent things for any young man trying to do it, but there's a lot of other associated uh, findings with it, like uh, depression, you know, uh, de you know, just general uh, change in your affect. So those are harder, in my mind, to attribute to the to medication, but patients do complain about it. But when you have a patient who's young, healthy, has a great interest in sex, et cetera, and they take this medication for hair loss and they can't get an erection, they have no interest in sex, they can't have any orgasm, those are real and those are directly in my opinion, definitely related to the drug. And what do you think is the approximate frequency of this post-finasteride syndrome? Yeah, that's probably where there's more debate, right? I think, and some people would say 5%, some people would say 15%. I mean, you, wow. it depends on where you look, but I, you know, I think about it like one in 10 guys will have appreciable issues with it. And it's not just the young men, it's in older men too. It's just that there may be on average less interested in sex or less sexually active. It's so less apparent in yes. an older guy. But you def I definitely see it. So it's why I never really use it in my practice. I mean, it's just such a limited drug, in part because the efficacy is limited, in my opinion, in terms of managing lower urinary tract symptoms. And then the side effects from it, this post-finasteride syndrome, are, are, are real. The duration of these sy symptoms can be uh, highly variable. So some people will stop the medication, and they'll have resolution within a couple of weeks once the drug washes out. But there are people that I know uh, who have it, you know, permanently. Yeah, there are case reports, and that's the really scary stuff, yeah. which is the case report of the guy who goes to see the hair doctor, they put him on finasteride, he experiences all of these symptoms, they're horrible, and yeah. they're very noticeable because he's 25 or yeah. 30. He stops taking the drug, and it never comes back. Yeah. So those are rare, like you say, but they're real and they are uh, associated with the drug and there's no doubt in my mind. Um, I guess the obvious question here is, 
let's assume that the frequency of this is one in 10 and we want to avoid it at all costs because we never know if it's reversible. Is there any sense of what predicts susceptibility to this? It's a good question. You know, it's a post hoc diagnosis. I haven't seen a great paper that really took a hundred or, a, you know, 500 men and really tried to evaluate what it was that would predict it. So not, I'm, I'm not aware of any high quality study that can help predict that association. Would you be comfortable then, and, and feel free to say no, uh, but, but would you be comfortable recommending to a patient who's considering using a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor for hair loss that they might be better off looking at other medical and non-medical therapies for hair loss? Yeah, I mean, I don't recommend it in, for use in any, any, any man. If it's one- BPH or otherwise. Yeah. Why, if you're taking it for hair loss, which I experienced at a very young age, so I know what that feels like, and it can have a real impact on an, a young individual's life, there's a lot of really effective therapies that you can do. I mean, hair transplant works very well. It's very precise, and I know people who've done it, and you know they're very satisfied with it. So I think there's alternatives. I think understanding what that spectrum of alternatives is is really important because when young guys go to these kind of pop-up shop clinics, they're not given the full kind of... Um, they don't have a consent with this. Yes, and they don't understand what the long-term effects are because in addition to um, the post finasteride syndrome, as a prostate cancer you know, biologist and, 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 and individual who treats people with prostate cancer, the other big thing has to do with what its effect is on your PSA value. So it, it halves your PSA value if you take the medication for one to two or two to three years. And after five years of on, being on the medication, it, it reduces your PSA number by about 2.5x. So it and will, that does not come back? If you stop the medication, your PSA will, will rise. But the biggest issue is not whether or not it suppresses your PSA or not. It's lack of awareness that it does yeah. amongst the patients and the providers. Because if you're going to some men's health clinic for your finasteride or your, you know, your, your finasteride for your head lo hair loss, you may not mention it to your internist. And, and usually when you start that for hair loss, you maintain it for life. Yep. And so you, I, I, classic case, I see it probably every other week of a guy whose PSA is rising on finasteride. If your PSA begins to rise on finasteride, we'll talk about PSA in general in a sec. Yep. If your PSA rises on finasteride, you have a problem. That is a warning sign that there is a cancer and likely an aggressive cancer growing in your prostate. Wow. And guys aren't aware of it. And there'll be guys whose PSA- And not just guys, it might be that physicians are. That's right. So if you're a yeah. man, you take finasteride starting at age 25. Um, you start at age 25 and it's, uh, your PSA is 0.5. Think about this. You may, it may begin to rise and it goes between, let's say now you're 50. So 20 years later, it goes between 0.5 to 1 to 2 to 4. That's four years where your PSA is doubling which tells you you got a really bad problem before it's even anywhere near being on the radar of the patient or their internist. So in my opinion, it's just, you got to be very, very careful with these medications, particularly taking them that long. And this says nothing about the other issue, which is not having DHT probably isn't a good thing if you're in the business of taking advantage of your androgen receptors, right? You're yeah. taking away the most potent androgen in the body and androgens do really good things yeah i mean i i think uh absolutely i mean the the impact on a man i mean if you the extreme examples are those individuals with no testosterone we induce that in individuals with advanced prostate cancer and there are rare cases for men who are born with no testosterone at all but in general yes i mean for a healthy man you know, it's absolutely imperative, in my opinion, that you maintain a, you know, eugonadal state. And that's debatable what that means. But I think, in my opinion, you can titrate to a functional eugonadal state in almost all men if their testosterone levels are low. But having testosterone around is just critical for... for everything from metabolic, everything. metabolic health to structural health. Everything. Really for everything. And probably mood and a whole bunch of other things. All that. Exactly. Okay. Now let's talk about the relationship between testosterone and DHT and the development of prostate cancer over a man's lifetime. So one of the, you know, 
obvious statements is <clears throat> when a man has the most testosterone and presumably DHT in his body, so let's just take out the case of guys who are taking uh, five alpha reductase yeah. inhibitors. So when a man is in his 20s, you know, call it 18 to 20, 18 to 30, his testosterone and DHT are through the roof. We don't see guys getting prostate cancer. Yes. Um, similarly, by the way, we don't see women getting breast cancer when their average. estrogen is at their yeah. highest either. Yeah. So, so we know there's, we know that the story is more complicated than the caricature is, Yes. which is not to say that these hormones don't matter because to your point a moment ago, when you have men with metastatic prostate cancer or untreatable prostate cancer, hormone deprivation therapy is a core treatment. Yes. So how do we reconcile those two observations? Well, it has to just, there's a time dependent co-variable here, right? So you, you will, it, when you have, there's lots of things that testosterone does at a cellular level, right? It impacts um, damage to the DNA, repair of that damage to the DNA, all these different things that people I don't think really fully appreciate. But um, I think when you have, when you go through your surge of testosterone, whatever that may be, if your puberty, you know, your peak in, in is at age, age 18 or age 25, wherever your peak is, I think you begin to reset um, the functional code right? So you're born with your DNA, but it's not really, for the most part, what's in your DNA that matters. It's the epigenetic, you know, changes that result in the RNA trans, trans, you know, location transition that really is the most important thing. So I think that you begin to mark and see differences in terms of the epigenetics of different genes within a Test an androgen responsive organ that then sets the stage for your potential risk for developing prostate cancer, right? So I think that there's a correlation between testosterone and and subsequent, you know, future diagnosis of prostate cancer, but it's just one of the many factors that plays a role. So if you don't have any testosterone, you're not gonna get prostate cancer because you won't have a prostate, right? That's the obvious one. Yeah. But I do think that there's a correlation between T and A, being a healthy male, and part of being a healthy male is a potential risk for developing prostate cancer. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, it does. And then, and then there's this other very interesting observation, and I don't know if this has been subsequently refuted, but I remember this probably when we were in residency, Ted, that there was that paper that came out that found that men with lower testosterone, this was in the New England Journal of Medicine, yeah. were at risk for higher grade prostate cancers. Yes. The, the sort of teleologic explanation was, <clears throat> at least this was my teleologic explanation, if you are developing prostate cancer in the presence of low androgens, you have a very sensitive, you have a cancer that's very sensitive and therefore is probably much higher grade. Is that still kind of the thinking or has the thinking evolved significantly? Yeah. So we just published a paper on this. We, we looked at 100,000 prostate cancer transcriptomes. And we Where did, did you get so much? We did this data. in partnership with the company. Originally it was called Decipher. Now it was it's owned by a company called Verisite. Okay. And I did this with uh, the the founder of the company, you, I've had you a, this with Eli, Eli DaVincioni. Okay. And uh, we looked at their database of now they now have 140,000 plus prostate cancer transcriptomes. Wow. So if you just, we, we just asked a simple question. If you take prostate cancers and you do AI-based hierarchical clustering, just looking for patterns, do you see different types of cancer? Not, you know, grade or stage, but different types from the perspective of the transcriptome of prostate cancer, and you do. So you see two general themes. One, you see luminal-like prostate cancers and basal-like prostate cancers. And then within that sub-classification of luminal basal, there are kind of effectively aggressive luminals. Explain to people the difference between the luminal and basal yeah. side. So, so I was gonna, I'll circle okay. back. Yeah, so yeah. you can see aggressive luminals and, and, and then aggressive basals and then less aggressive ones. So where is this all coming from? So if you take a look back at embryonic development and you, people have done this, I did this in my postdoc study, what happens to the prostate in a mouse or a rat when you begin to take away testosterone and give it back, you can see that the prostate, as we mentioned before, grows in response in part to testosterone and to estrogens around. But if you castrate a mouse, 
all of the luminal cells. Post-maturity. Yes. You okay. develop a normal prostate and you castrate a mouse or a rat with the prostate, it will regress. And think about it like, just like a plant in the middle of a drought, right? It looks dead, but there's roots that are still alive, yep. okay? Those roots that are still alive in the prostate are predominantly basal cells. If you give that prostate back its growth uh, fuel, testosterone or DHT, um, then it will regrow a new prostate. And the basal cells uh, will begin to repopulate and you'll get also a proliferation of these luminal cells that will then form the big, bulky, meaty prostate that we think about. Let's say just think like a, a B, the BPH part mm -hmm. portion of the prostate. So you have luminal cells and the luminal cells in development, and we believe in prostate cancer, are exquisitely sensitive to testosterone's androgens, okay? The basal cells, the cells that survive the drought, the cells that survive in the absence of effectively any testosterone at all, yep. those are the ones that form more basal-like tumors, which are very, very aggressive, okay? So when I look at somebody with prostate cancer, yes, I look at their grade, yes, I look at their stage, but I also look at the genomics of their tumor and what's the biology of their tumor because they may have a big, bulky, luminal, proliferating, or luminal tumor, but I know a, it's exquisitely sensitive to testosterone suppression, which is something that I have in my back pocket. And B, it's less likely to start spreading to other parts of the body. Why or, is that? Because it's, it, it's the, if, it, if think about because it. Because it's on like, the basal side? No, if it's, a luminal, if it's a luminal type tumor, think about it. It's more dependent on that testosterone rich microenvironment with the DHT around. It doesn't do as well theoretically living in the bone marrow when it metastasizes to the bone or the lymph nodes. This is Where very it, counterintuitive. On the one hand, you're saying it's a more aggressive tumor. Locally bulky. But on the other hand, you're saying less likely to survive metast uh, metastatic spread. Yeah. If you look, which we've done, wow. the distribution of a luminal differentiated tumor in a localized state is about 40%. Okay. If you look at how many metastatic lesions... So you take tumors that are metastatic, it's only, it's less than 10% are luminal differentiated because they, they just don't have the capacity to survive and spread to other parts of the body. Whereas a basal tumor, which is by nature able to survive in the absence of testosterone and or uses alternate growth pathways to testosterone because it doesn't have, it's not, it's not dependent on it those tumors are more capable of spreading to other parts of the body. So this is kind of a great tragedy. It means that the cancers, the prostate cancers that are most likely to kill you, which by definition are the ones that spread, are also the most capable of thriving Abating. in a low testosterone environment. That's right. And therefore are least hurt by androgen deprivation. Yes. But, I mean, this is just, you know, things that we've been working on this thesis, Eli and I, for now a decade, but we have this data now that is, uh, we just published this year, and lots of other interesting uh, studies coming out that really kind of support this idea. So that's why, in my opinion, I am very comfortable with a patient who is, have, has, who has a low testosterone being on testosterone supplementation if they have a low T, either during the process of being diagnosed with their cancer or in their, their recovery phase. Because I know that if they were to develop a recurrent disease, a recurrence of their cancer, it's most likely a luminal type, and we can exquisitely modulate that tumor with testosterone. So it's a big step. It's a big step in a different direction. It takes a lot to think about it, but it, in my opinion, it really helps us understand the biology not so much of localized prostate cancers, but rather when you have a localized cancer that has the capacity to spread. So a localized cancer with lethal potential. And what's the nature of that, of that tumor? How do you begin to attack it? And understanding the molecular underpinnings of it is key. That's precision medicine. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got these 100,000 transcriptomes. They've given you this insane amount of insight Yes. How often can you now predict based on a man's genetics? Well, or do we, you need a tissue biopsy 
to map to the transcriptome to say, yeah. aha. Let's talk about the transcriptome of the tumor. So once a patient has a diagnosis, you can get the transcriptome information. It's provided to the providers. It's not commercially available. And the reason that we it's not provided commercially because we, you have to be cautious about how you interpret that data and what you, you, you advise the patient until we have more information from clinical trials about, well, what does a particular molecular phenotype mean for the, A, how you treat their new, new diagnosed localized, or potentially if they have a recurrent disease, how you should better treat it. But those trials are now in process or are just being built based on some of this work. Now, that's the transcript. Don't Sorry, just to be clear, Ted, does that mean that someone listening to this who has a biopsy of their prostate, their physician will get this information back, but won't necessarily know how to interpret it? If, if a patient gets a biopsy of their tumor yep. and they have genomic testing with Decipher Verocyte, which I don't have any conflicts with, by the way, they will then get a, a simple readout of how aggressive is their tumor. It's a molecular Gleason score. Okay. But on the back end, in addition to measuring those 21 different genes that consist of the decipher score, they capture the whole transcript over that tumor. Yep. And you can get access to what they call the grid report, which gives you this whole deep dive into what's the biology and nature and phenotype of that particular tumor, which for me, I look at, and I will then look at that and then say, okay, this patient on paper perhaps has an X or a Y or Z, but the, the, the molecular phenotype of the tumor is favorable or it's not favorable. I'm going to alter what I recommend to the patient based on that. So that's how I interpret it. It's kind of experimental use only, so to speak. Yep. But, but it is the direction of precision. It's medicine. the future of it. And so based on these papers and many, many others, not just the one that I, I did this one, but many, many other papers with really great scientists, they are the platform for, through which all clinical trials in prostate cancer um, are now reliant on. So the decipher score as, a, as an entry criteria, as a predictor for intensification or deintensification of therapy um, is part of almost all clinical trials going through the, the National Institute of Health right now, which is exciting. Yeah, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about the pathogenesis. Um, you talked earlier about the transition zone and the peripheral zone, the orange analogy. Um, I'm assuming that most prostate cancers develop in the peripheral zone. Correct. And um, the reason for that is that we didn't state this earlier, but you would think or hope, I suppose, that any man who's undergoing uh, prostate cancer or prostate tissue removal for BPH would have a lower risk of prostate cancer because hey, you just shed 80% yeah. of your prostate. That doesn't seem to be the case, correct? Well, it doesn't necessarily change their risk for developing prostate cancers in the future. However, it changes your ability to monitor them for the development of prostate cancer because remember, the PSA blood test is, you know, it, it's, um, it's been often criticized but it's a very powerful tool, and it just depends on how you use that blood test to identify people at risk for potentially having prostate cancer. Yeah, I, I want to really so, talk about this in a minute because there are a few things that annoy me more than people who harp on how bad the PSA is, which to me means, no, it's how bad you are at using it. Like, the PSA is a remarkable test. So the issue arises from this overlap in the test because it's not prostate cancer specific it's prostate specific. So the beauty of having my partner, Amy Cranbach, do a hole up and take out 90% of your prostate is, that reduces 90% of the PSA producing cells. The PSA should be below one, but it makes the test way more sensitive for me to follow yep. for a future potential risk of developing prostate cancer. So in general, I would say that, yes, the specificity of the tool changes based on how much prostate tissue you have. So the PSA test is actually exquisitely sensitive in young men to their future risk for developing prostate cancer because they have such limited amounts of transition zone tissue and the bulk of their prostate is just peripheral zone. So why is it that the, that the cells in the peripheral zone are susceptible to becoming neoplastic? 
yeah, as opposed a, to the cells in the transitional it's zone? It's a great question because under the microscope, there, there are some subtle differences as to how they look, but people don't know why that particular zone or that zonal anatomy is such that you have a higher risk of developing it there. It's obviously very unfortunate because the real estate as a name, problem as the name implies it's in the periphery and what's just outside of the prostate is the high high price real estate of the nerves for erection the nerves for for uh, urinary continence and the muscles for urinary continence so that has a big impact on how we manage prostate cancer and it's been a result that's what results in a lot of the potential side effects that occur but in general yes in young men psa is a very potent way for us to initially screen someone for their prostate cancer risk. And your PSA, if you're young, good numbers to remember for the listeners, P median PSA for a 40-year-old, 0.5. Median PSA for a 50-year-old, 1. So if your number's over those medians, those age-adjusted medians, then you need to just take action. Do you have to have a prostatectomy? No. But, but, but then here's the problem we talked about earlier. A lot of those guys are going to be on 5-alpha reductase inhibitors these days and now those numbers become very difficult to interpret. Yes, they do. They become difficult to interpret and difficult to follow. So if your numbers are over those, then any you should just consider a kind of annual or twice you know, every other year kind of intensive follow-up. It doesn't mean that you have prostate cancer, but it means if you're over that median that you have a much higher risk in your future next 20 or 30 years of developing it. Again, the issue is in young men who are on 5-alpha reductase inhibitors or PSAs are going to be very, very low, and you may miss an yep. early blip. And it, actually, there's a great, as a somewhat sidebar, there's a great paper published out of the um, group at UCSD looking at finasteride and dutasteride use in veterans. So it's a closed access system. And they asked the question, is use of dutasteride and finasteride associated with more prostate cancer lethalities? Mm. And it's highly, hotly debated about whether or not the drugs actually induce more aggressive cancers and result in, in that. But if you just take that as a side, as a more public health kind of issue, the answer was glaringly yes, there was a huge increased risk of death from prostate cancer in men on finasteride and dutasteride. Why? For the reason we talked about, neglect. Yep. You don't realize you're on it, you don't know your numbers are rising. Your internist has no idea that your PSA of four isn't really four, it's 10, because yep. you've been on the meds for 10 years. So it's years. not necessarily, we certainly don't know if 5-alpha reductase inhibition impacts prostate cancer biology, but to our point about detection, yes. it impedes detection. Yes. And, you know, I think I think that there may be an impact on, on the actual subtly on the biology, but that's l less of a real, yep. you know, kind of general issue. It's really being a lack of awareness of the biomarker that you use to screen for prostate cancer and the effect that dutasteride and finasteride have on that biomarker. How many uh, cases of prostate cancer are associated with germline gene that, you know, germline genes that we know are drivers, you know, for example, the equivalent of a BRCA mutation in breast yeah. cancer, or is it virtually all somatic mutation? It is very limited. So there are a class of, 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 um, proteins, molecules that res, uh, affix homologous recombination uh, uh, defects. And those um, HRD classes of, of, of molecules include BRCA1 and BRCA2. The actual protein complex that fixes double-strand DNA breaks is really, really big. So there's lots of different genes that fit within that kind of protein complex that fixes a double strand break. That's what that's what BRCA1 and BRCA2 do classically. But the most potent of the different genes in that grouping of HRD molecules is BRCA2 for men. So mm -hmm. individual men, it's about 1% or less of the general population have a BRCA2 deficiency, uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 deficiency. Those men are at increased risk for developing breast cancer and prostate cancer. And in the case of prostate cancer, if you develop prostate cancer, it's a, a more aggressive disease course, and you have to be very, very careful with individuals who have that deficiency and have prostate cancer. But on average, it's very rare, probably less than 2% of prostate cancer cases, localized prostate cancers diagnosed, are attributable to a germline genetic alteration. There are mutations in those same pathways 
somatically seen within the tumor, right? Not in the germline, but in the tumor yep. that are attributed and related to cancer aggressiveness and progression of cancer. Mm. Um, the classic one, in my opinion. So, so the way I think about prostate cancer in very general terms is you can have localized prostate cancers. These are these lower grade lesions on average. Localized prostate cancers with lethal potential, so LCLP, right? You got a localized cancer with lethal potential. And in my mind, the general genetic trait associated with that transition from localized to localized with lethal potential is, an, is something to do with the P10 AKT pathway. And that doesn't mean that you have a lethal tumor if you have P10 loss, but it, in my mind, it begins to open up the book to say lots of other mischief and nonsense can go on within the tumor. We know from lots of studies that if you have loss of P53, for example, yeah, of course. that that's associated with lethal prostate cancer, amplification of MYC. Lethal cancer in general. Yes, yeah. exactly. Amplification of MYC is another one too. It's the emperor Okay, so of it's all. interesting. So basically between MYC and p P, uh, th uh, P53 uh, and all of KRAS. I mean, I'm That's sure right. KRAS is associated so, as well. Okay. Less so KRAS, but yes, those are classic markers of lethal cancers. And so prostate is not, you know, uh, yep. you know, immune to that as well. Got it. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, non-genetic risk factors, or at least non, um, or we can include sort of polygenic stuff that's Im yeah. embedded. So one of the things I always remember from training, African-American men at, at a higher risk. Why? Yeah. No one knows. Um, I like to think of, there's a great paper published by this uh, scientist at USC, Chris Heyman, and they looked at um, genomic risk you know, through SNPs for individuals who did or did not develop prostate cancer. It was like 235,000 guys, ton, a ton of individuals. How did they know what SNPs to look at? Well, they did. They, they, there's, a, there's been lots of work in, 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 in single nucleotide polymorphism and risk for prostate cancer. And then this paper was a refreshed look at saying how many SNPs are actually out there associated with risk of developing prostate cancer. Okay. And it's somewhere around 250 or 260. I don't know the exact number, but there's a certain amount. So what they did was they developed a genomic risk score based on how many SNPs you had and your likelihood or probability of developing prostate cancer. And what they showed was that, that although there's no difference between SNP profiles in men of African ancestry, because they could look genomically where their ancestry was, and Caucasians or non-black men, um, there was an enrichment for that same group of, you know, of SNPs in black men and an enrichment in men who were diagnosed with prostate cancer at a young age. So why is it that there's an enrichment of these different portfolio of, of SNPs in black men? And why is there an enrichment in the younger men? We don't know, but we, it doesn't appear as though the tumors are profoundly different from a genomic perspective. And we've looked ourselves, we had a series of grants to look at, again, you know, somatic alterations in prostate tumors between black and white men with lethal tumors. We found a difference in the, in the cell cycle gene pathway, but again, these are single percentile differences. Mm. So what exactly is driving the development of more prostate cancers in black men than white men? is thought to be at this point kind of environmental. So, you know, what is their exposure to, um, you know, epigenetic changes? What's their exposure to uh, smoking? It's in general in urban, you know, uh, populations of, of black individuals, there's more smoking. It has, it correlates with the um, food deserts, all these different kinds of epigenetic factors. I see, so it may not actually be hardwired. It's not hardwired. And most of the kind of- That's great news. It is good news. And so, yes, I, I think people would bundle that under this kind of umbrella of social determinants of health. Yep. But you can actually begin to really begin to connect those two ends of what the, are the social determinants and then what is the impact on the SNPs and the epigenetic changes that occur. So I think a great future project would be to take that and look at exposures in Think about it like your exposures in, a, in an environment with high smoke, high pollution, poor foods, and the epigenetic changes that occur when you're having a surge in your testosterone in your 20s. That begins to hardwire that person's cells for future development of prostate cancer. Yeah. 
And that's kind of how I think about it now because we did. I spent a decade looking for the smoking gun, the heritable germline change. There are some out there, but they're not very but they're big not guns. Big enough. They're not big enough to be, you know, associated with that change. And so this paper that Chris did and his team of you know, there's like 150 authors. His spectacular work um, really begins to provide more insights. So this is the UCSD group that led this. UC, USC. Uh, oh, USC. USC. Okay. Um, Chris Heyman is the last author and um, blanking on the first author's name. Great, we'll, great we'll, publication. We'll link to that yeah. paper. Yeah. So it gives you a sense of, you know, so then why are there different subpopulations of individuals that have different risks? It's likely just enrichments for these single nucleotide polymorphism changes, which by the way, if you look at that paper, if you had the highest let's say decile or quartile of SNPs, you had about a five-fold increased risk of developing prostate cancer compared to the average man, which is the same fold increase as if you're BRCA2 deficient. Wow. So having a poor genomic risk score is just as potent as having deficiency in BRCA2, which we know is not good. And the penetrance of BRCA2 and BRCA1 for prostate cancer are how high? Like eighty percent ish. No, lifetime risk is is less than that. A lifetime risk is somewhere on the order of um, sixty to seventy okay. percent. So, so penetrant enough that you treat it enough. As, we would keep our. We would definitely do intensive screening for yeah. them, but it's not a guarantee. But it's are you do you know obviously women that are highly penetrant and at a very young age. That's yeah, not true but, for men. But in yeah, average. But but you know, it's not unreasonable for a woman to undergo a prophylactic mastectomy. Yes. If she is, uh, if she has a, a deficient copy of the BRCA gene, are any men considering prophylactic prostatectomy? Not at this point, because we the difference is we have very powerful screening tools. Those it tools gets work back to Halstead versus Fisher, and those screening tools work just as well in individuals who are BRCA deficient. So their tumors may be more aggressive when they're diagnosed, but we have very powerful tools to a identify them early and b monitor them once they're picked up. And so it doesn't necessarily change that paradigm, yep. which is different for breast because you have to wait till you have a visible lesion, which yep. a visible lesion on mammogram is what, 40 or 50 million cells? You know, oh, I, you know I what would I mean? guess closer to a billion. I don't think it's a, a centi billion. A centimeter? Well, well, we'll we'll try to find something for the show notes, but yes, it's yeah. it's a ton of cells. Yeah, yeah. Whereas we have much better tools yeah, yeah. to look at yeah. that with, with the blood test. And, and hopefully, with breast cancer, we're going to see liquid biopsies and cell free DNA adding more to that. Um, As a biomarker, it's definitely you know shows promise. I mean, yeah. there's lots of those liquid things. It's not essential for our space because we have a very good one. Yep. Um, another esoteric risk I kind of vaguely remember, and I don't know if I'm remembering it correctly. Is there an inverse relationship between the frequency of ejaculation and the development of prostate cancer? Yeah, there's an epidemiologic study that shows that men who are ejaculating more than 20 times a month, that there was a lower risk of developing prostate cancer. It's never been, you know, that the state, the paper you're remembering is the really the paper on that topic. It still exists. And so what, how big was the hazard ratio? Is it worth paying attention to? And yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't remember because it's so old. I mean, I yeah. certainly don't, you know, I, I don't, you know, to be honest, I've never thought about encouraging, you know, uh, increased ejaculation for the- As, as a my, preventative strategy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's not a bad idea, but I've never, it's never occurred to me to kind of encourage yeah. that. So, and, and, so and it's not, the idea isn't that prostatic stasis in the absence of ejaculation allows something to occur in the prostate that, that leads to the development either through the microenvironment or- other genetic issues. I mean, I, I, point is, we have no further insight than that we epidemiologic know, study. But that it's is, not a bad one. I think the converse would be horrific for men. Like, don't ejaculate because they'll lower your risk of cancer. So yeah. it's not. It's like a kind of a win-win, right? Yeah, That's how yeah. I think about it. Okay. So so let's now get into but, the nuts and bolts. So yeah, let's ahead. talk about a couple other risk factors um, besides, you know, ancestry. Which is huge. Which is, of B course- Bigger than many cancers. Yes. Um, so it's not just black patients. You know, you have to think about, um, or not just African Americans, but there's a, you know, there's anybody with a West African ancestry is really what is the most significant. 
in that risk factor. And then there's um, other ones. So Ashkenazi Jewish individuals have a much higher chance of harboring, hmm. you know, foundry mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. So I always talk about ancestry and then I talk about all cancer risks, right? When I'm taking a family history, I say, what's your personal history of prostate cancer? And if you have a personal history of prostate cancer, you're meaning a father, uncle, or brother. So first degree relative. Father, uncle, brother. brother. Okay. The number of individuals and the age that they were diagnosed, and we'll put a link in the show note for the table, it increases your full risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer significantly. It doesn't mean you need to change, you shouldn't have a prophylactic prostatectomy, but you should just have intensive, intensive monitoring. That's what we recommend. What about grandfather? Grandfather is not. It's if it first skips the generation, yeah. it doesn't matter. So yeah. your grandfather has prostate cancer, but none of your brother. It's not considered to be a family history of, of prostate. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about grandfather and father? Is that worse than just father? Father is the driver for that. Okay. So family history, um, so ancestry, um, right? And then family history. And then individual patients, so smoking. It is classically linked with breath, uh, with lung cancer and classically linked with bladder cancer, urothelial carcinoma. Yes. But smoking is associated with more the development of more aggressive prostate cancer. So, so not necessarily more prostate cancer, but when you get it, it's worse. Yes, and at a younger age. So the, the correlation is younger age onset, more aggressive cancer. What's with the youngest patient you've ever seen with prostate 34. cancer? 34. That is... Yeah. staggering to me. Yeah. I would have never guessed no, that. I'll never forget that, that, that gentleman's, you know, I, I have his picture in my brain. He didn't survive? He, we treated him um, and he, he lived, he's still alive now, but still, when you have a 34 year old and, the, and his wife sitting there going like, what? You know, so I've, I've subsequently diagnosed young men with prostate cancer and then subsequently treated their fathers. So they had their cancer before, before their, their father, dads. which is also mind boggling, right? Tell, tell me a little bit about this guy's case. What was there? Was there just some freak gene thing that, you know, the, the youngest man, the 34 year old was early in my career at Hopkins where we had such a lack of understanding of the genetic risks and so forth. So I would love to go back and pull his tumor and you know, just sequence the whole thing. But he presented how? Some, he just presented with a rising He PSA. went in for a, he wanted to get a $250 discount on his health insurance for the year. So he got a routine screening through his work and they picked up a PSA that was like 10 and he's 34. And he wasn't from an infection. So. But anything below what is freakish? 50? So the median age of diagnosis for prostate cancer is 68. We would consider early prostate cancer, which would be a criteria for doing genetic screening at around 50. Okay. So hereditary could be young age of onset, so 50. Uh, I, I, if, I am, if I'm not mistaken, I believe type 2 diabetes and metabolic disease also increase the risk of they do. prostate cancer as it does breast cancer and endometrial cancer, Absolutely. And a number of cancers. Um, and also the aggressiveness and likelihood and probability of recurrence. Okay. All the other things really have never been, you know, fully supported with any decent follow-up studies. So these different products in the skin of grape, you know, broccoli, tomato. Um, oh, you mean as preventive yeah, things? Yeah, they really haven't been linked with any real increased or decreased risk for developing prostate cancer. So let's talk about the PSA a little bit because we've yeah. alluded to it a number of times. So let's explain what it is, where it comes from, and, and more importantly, of course, how we use it. Yeah. So PSA is a, is a protein. It exists to aid in the liquefaction of semen. So it's produced by the prostate. And if one were to um, measure PSA in semen, it would be very, very high. I always tell people, if you looked at PSA in the semen, it would be, I don't know, 100,000 nanograms per milliliter of PSA in semen. It's designed to be there and it exists there to liquefy the semen to help in the process of fertilization. It is not designed and it should not exist in the blood, but a certain percentage of PSA made in prosthetic epithelial cells leaks into the bloodstream. And when we do a PSA blood test, we're measuring the PSA that has leaked into the bloodstream from a prostatic epithelial cell. Now, 
most of the PSA that leaks into the bloodstream is bound to other proteins. A certain percentage- and Is that like albumin mostly or sex alpha, binding globulin? Alpha chymotryptin. Oh, so it's its own separate yeah. binding protein. Yeah. It has, that's the most common protein that PSA binds to, but it can bind to a family of three or four or four or five different. But these are prostatic proteins. Yeah. Yeah. It's bound. Now, how much it's processed, because as you know, proteins just don't come out finished. They grow into the, their final state and they grow by shrinking, right? They get things snipped off of them as they're maturing and, and, and going through that process. As PSA is evolving in the normal kind of development of its exocrine function, it gets snipped into smaller and smaller states. Fully, fully processed PSA can float around in the bloodstream freely. That's free PSA. So if you have a benign prosthetic epithelial cell, a lot of its PSA will be fully processed and ready to go in the ejaculate, let's just say. And if it leaks into the bloodstream, it can float around freely. You can measure it in an assay and it's what we call free PSA. A lot of the unprocessed or incompletely processed PSA is bound to protein. Alpha chymotryptin is the most common one. And that is what we would consider to be when we do a measurement of, when we're looking at total PSA, you're measuring mostly bound PSA and mm -hmm. some free PSA. And that ratio we use, you and I use in our practices to help discriminate against PSA that's in the bloodstream that may have leaked from a cancer cell or may have leaked from a benign epithelial cell. Now, there are other siblings of PSA that are also produced in prosthetic epithelial cells, of course, all in response to androgens. They're produced in those cells and they can also leak into the bloodstream. And we use those in some advanced PSA-based blood testing as well. But in general, when we are measuring PSA, we are measuring the amount of PSA, this protein, that's leaked from a prosthetic epithelial cell into the bloodstream. We can refine that value by saying how much of it is, how much is there and how much is free. If we have high amounts of free PSA, 30%, for example, then we can have good reassurance that most of the PSA in the blood that you're detecting is from benign cells. When most of the PSA that you have in your blood is um, bound, very limited amounts of free PSA, that's a strong marker that there's something going on, i.e. that cancer cells are leaking the PSA into the bloodstream. Now, as I mentioned, you can also measure other byproducts, um, other, other types of free PSA or other sibling molecules to PSA. PSA is called HK3 or human calcine 3. You can measure, for example, how much of human calcarine 2 is in the blood. And these are part of it, more advanced PSA tests like the 4K score, or for example, the prostate health index. These are both mathematical equations that predict probability of aggressive cancers, but they're built off of looking at not just the PSA itself, but the PSA and how much other types of process PSA exist as well. Let's go back and talk a little bit about the free PSA. Um, does the amount of free PSA that we would want to see to be more assured of a benign nature of the PSA vary by age and absolute PSA level? Yes, it does. Um, so we begin to use the kind of free PSAs and the free PSA ratios and all those things when PSAs have crossed over a certain threshold, right? Because yeah, typically a lab, if you have your PSA is one, uh, we can't even get a lab to check a free that's PSA. Right. That's right. Because we know if you're, P if you're screening someone and your PSA is one, then the chances you, the probability of a prostate cancer that's lethal is incredibly low. Right, so that's why they they just don't they don't have the assay set up to check it, and oftentimes or some labs will not do that, you know, secondary default testing unless it's over four, for example, yes. or over two point five. We our lab set up to do everything at low at levels as low as two, so you can get them at lower levels. But in general, the idea is well, if your PSA is below two, the probability you have a lethal prostate cancer is you know less than one in a million, so we don't have to worry about that individual, and we really want to use the percent free PSA to discriminate yep. individuals who have elevated PSAs and having it discriminate between elevated because of B12 
BPH and elevated because of a cancer. So yes, and as and, you get older, your prostate enlarges, as we talked about, metabolic syndrome causes your prostate in, in large part to grow all, you know, just because mm -hmm. of the T to E ratios. Mm -hmm. um, as it gets, as you get older, your prostate gets bigger. So you, we begin to use that in, in, as you get older and your prostate gets bigger, you can have a proportional rise in total PSA in your bloodstream just because your prostate's bigger and it's leakier. But you can easily tease that out by looking at the percent free PSA. So if the percent free PSA is over 18 to 20, then you can be rest pretty well assured that that's likely not coming from some aggressive bulky tumor. What about with prostatitis when we see these huge spikes? Everything in goes PSA. up in those case, in those cases, but but does the free still remain disproportionately high? To well, it's a good question. I don't use free PSA yeah. in people because, because I'm you know tracking what the etiology. I'm is. tracking it. I'm literally looking for trends for coming back down to a new baseline. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about two other ways we use the PSA: the yeah. density and the velocity. How do those work? Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, as you get older your prostate on average gets bigger, not for all men, but for many men. And when that happens, your PSA can concordantly rise because it's just your prostate gets bigger and gets equal, it's equally leaky, so the PSA can kind of go up. Now, what we look at is the ratio of the prostate, the PSA value to the prostate volume. And that, as you alluded to, is called PSA density. And in general, when I, when I educate patients, I tell them, well, we want a a PSA to be about 10% of the volume of the prostate or less to kind of be in a safe range. So if your PSA is four and your prostate's 40 grams, which is a, about average size for a 60, 65 year old guy, that's a PSA density of 0.1. We know that that is correlated with a low risk of having an aggressive prostate cancer. So when when I'm looking at someone's case, I want to know what their PSA density is. If the PSA density in a young man, frankly, is more than 0.1, I get a little worried. Mm -hmm. If on an average age person, if the PSA density is more than 0.15, I also get, I start saying, let's do some additional testing. Mm -hmm. So I put every, you put everything together, but yes, PSA density predicts likelihood that you'd ever be diagnosed with prostate cancer. It predicts aggressiveness of a cancer if you're diagnosed with it, and it actually predicts your outcome if you have a prostate cancer. So the higher your PSA density, the more significant your disease will be. So the faster it increases. And the faster that your PSA rises, it is a canary in the coal mine to say, hey, you need to do some additional evaluation. Now, it doesn't mean you have prostate cancer, yep. because I often have, and we share patients where their PSA went from one to five, but they had... We, we, we tracked it and it came back down because they had a flare up or inflammation in their prostate that made their PSA go, sometimes we don't know why, often mm -hmm. we don't know why, but if you track it, you can see that. So whenever somebody in general comes to see me with an elevated PSA, the first thing I always do is just recheck it because there can be transient rises in the PSA. Now, as you know, we have very similar practice. I don't just recheck the PSA, I always order advanced PSA-based testing. What does that mean? That is testing that involves looking at the percent free PSA and then other things like minus two pro PSA for the prostate health index test or the 4K score, which basically will looks at different calocrines and their ratios. So, And you and I discussed these tests in great detail in the first podcast, so we can also yeah. refer people yeah. back to those um, so that I won't make you re-explain them. But um, it does surprise me that the official screening guidelines for prostate cancer uh, don't make any recommendation on the use of PSA testing other than something benign like discussed, every patient should discuss this with their physician, which is a, a real cop-out in my view of what we should be doing. Is that still, is that? Well, it depends on which guideline you're looking at. So the American urologist. This was the. This is the, the guideline. U.S. Of, preventative. This is the Task U.S. Force. Preventative Task Force yeah. and the CDC. Yeah. Um, and there's one other that is. Yeah, the American Cancer Society, uh, the American Urology Society, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. They're a little bit more progressive. They really suggest that you should talk about the risks and the benefits of screening. They kind of skirt around the idea of well, how do you properly screen for 
well, AUA and, 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 and the American Cancer Society don't get into details up front. They say, start the discussion with like, what's your potential risk for developing prostate cancer? You can ascertain that with the family history. Mm. Again, if you're reading the AUA guidelines or the American Cancer Society guidelines, you already have a leg up on the average internist because an average internist is just looking at general things they learned in med school or the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which is too general and too vague. So yep. I totally agree with you. I like and personally reference everybody to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network's prostate cancer screening guideline. That basically says that every man at age 45 should have a baseline PSA. Because as you mentioned, changes over time are key. They're critical. And you want to know where you are in relationship to the median, right? So a 45-year-old man's median PSA between 0.5 and 0.7, somewhere around there. Understand your median PSA. And then if your PSA is below one, you could just get reach you can get rechecked in two to four years. If your PSA but, but Ted, isn't I mean the, the test is free. It doesn't cost anything to do a PSA. It is. Why wouldn't we do this every single year? You I guess the argument against it is that um, there can be natural variations in P again. If you're a smart physician, you're going to pick up that, hey, there's natural variations. And if it goes up from 0.7 to 1.5, I'm going to recheck it and it's still in a safe range, et cetera, et cetera. I think that. But that's, isn't that all the more reason to do frequent testing if there's natural variation? Because it also means that if you're testing infrequently, you're more likely in the presence of natural variation to miss what the actual trend is. Like, think of the following thought experiment, right? So yeah. I love doing the thought experiment. So my yeah. thought experiment with colorectal cancer is. Imagine you had a low cost, zero risk colonos you know, colonoscopy that you could do on somebody every month. Yep. Would you eliminate colorectal cancer? Yes. There'd be no such thing as colorectal cancer. Yes. Right? The third leading cause of cancer death is gone if you have that. Now the reason we don't do that is they're not free and they're not risk free. Yeah. Okay. Well, similarly, Imagine you had, just like we have a continuous glucose monitor, a continuous PSA monitor yeah. you could slap yeah. on somebody's arm and you could for free basically measure their PSA yeah. over their lifetime. I would argue there would be no such thing as lethal prostate cancer because provided you had the AI engine and the physician to monitor this, you would, you would know, oh, you know, Johnny yeah. rode his bike. Johnny had yeah. sex. Johnny, you know, had a urinary had a had a prostate infection. But you would you would very quickly be able to pick up signal from noise. Yeah. I, well, I think I don't disagree with you. It's just a matter of how frequent what what is considered to be intensive PSA testing, right? And so, but annual, let's just say annually, right? Well, annual PSA testing is very intensive. So all the trials that showed that screening for prostate cancer with the PSA test those trials had tested whether or not that reduced deaths, which they showed it did by 20 to 25%, was PSA testing every two to four years. So that's the baseline. So what we do in the U.S. But is can we do better is my point. Because to your point, it's still the second leading cause of cancer, death. It is. It is. And the, the, the real question is, um, which we don't know the answer to, is which, were those men that ended up dying of their prostate cancer offered early screening or not? Yeah. And that's, we don't know that. And then the other thing is with a little bit more of an invent, uh, with a little bit more of an investment in knowing prostate size, if you could now get that prostate density. So now if you yeah. have from one blood measurement that costs less than a pack of gum, you know, your PSA, you know, your free PSA, you know, your PSA density. Yeah. That's really powerful. Yeah. By but, the way, a 4K test is a thousand dollar test. You don't right. need to do it, you don't need it if you know PSA, free PSA, and PSA density. Yes. And many would argue that pack of gum, chiclets, <laughs> those three things. Chiclets, those three I think it's things. Cheap, they're cheaper than a pack of gum. But yes, I think well, the PSA density is the more expensive. But part. you could, but you can get that off an ultrasound. You which can, is, which is it's free, basically. It's free. I mean, time to, for the. Yeah, you don't but, need to do an MRI. Bottom line, people would argue that percent free PSA gives you some uh, of strong correlation between size, the size. Yep. So yes, I I totally agree with you. I'm just pushing back, Ted, because. I mean, look, you and I want the same thing, but yeah. I view this as a, I don't, I view, look, there are certain things that I don't see 
a clear step on the horizon for the elimination, right? Like yeah. I don't see an immediate step on the horizon for people not dying of pancreatic cancer. Yeah. I don't see, sadly, an immediate step on the horizon for people not dying, women specifically, breast. of breast yeah. cancer. But I sure as hell see, with the existing technology, a reason for people not to be dying of colorectal cancer and men not to be dying of prostate yeah. cancer. I mean, the deaths from prostate cancer with PSA screening have plummeted. So yeah. that's the one thing. But and it's we, still 35,000 men died last year. And so the question, the question is, I, I, would, they, would they have not, how many of them would have been saved with a traditional screening? Yeah. 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 And, and, and trust me, I'm trying to defend the rule makers that made these rules that, that, that I was not involved with. But I would say that the, this idea of baseline PSA testing at age 40 on a population health level, where that all came about was from, from bank serum out of you know, Sweden. And so yep. they were able to mo model that pretty well to understand what's your overall lifetime risk for developing or dying from prostate cancer. If your PSA at age 40 or 50 is below the median, then your lifetime risk is very low, remember? Yep. So we have some information about it and the modelers, this is the best that they could come up with. I'm not disagreeing with you. I don't, there's no, pro, there's no reason in my mind why you should not get your PSA tested at an early age, understand your baseline and track it over time, which is I, what I, I, I do. I think the other, think the other lesson too. you and I have both witnessed personally is the patients need to take ownership of this. Yeah. We have both seen tragic cases where individuals who have no medical training, but who like listen to this podcast, for example, uh, have diagnosed their own prostate cancer, even when their physicians have said there's nothing wrong with you. Yes. Based on advanced metrics, such as PSA velocity and PSA density. And, 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 and that and, to me and, is and infuriating no, yeah. and yeah. heartwarming at the same time. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's, and, um, and many of those cases that we share are, are not like the subtle, you know, one in a thousand cases. They're like the ones that are like obvious. Yep. So I, I do think that patients can own this and this is a key part of their overall health. 100% agree with that. And I think that you you know I mean it's and it's the it's the mindset of the of the individual patient that also matters because there are some patients that don't want to be proactive and progressive about how they 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 monitor their health. Now those are people who you probably don't take care of at all. But I I you know sometimes I'll see them. Yep. And so yes, we have to balance knowing early with overreaction and kind of over treatment of a potential issue that may arise. So there's subtlety to it. Can it be done well? I believe it can be done well. Well, let's now talk about that because I think that if you look at people on the other side of this discussion who are saying, come on, this PSA test, I mean, there are a lot of people out there saying PSA should never be done. It's an awful test. It leads to a bunch of yeah. unnecessary misery for men because they're getting unnecessary biopsies. Now, let, let's sort of squash that nonsense. Yeah. That might've been true 50 years ago, but in the year 2023, in the hands of a competent physician, one step above the parking lot attendant, that's categorically untrue, right? Yeah. So today, let's talk about what we can do with an MRI to check if we have suspicion based on these other blood-based biomarkers, what can we do to increase the probability that if we actually go to the step of a biopsy, the probability is sufficiently high that it was worth it? Yeah, I mean, it's, you just said it, you order an MRI, which, which is, uh, is frankly like surprising and appalling to me that I see second opinions in my office weekly that they never had any pre-diagnostic, i.e. pre-biopsy MRI. It's absurd to me. Like when I leave work, I check on my Google map if there was an accident on the expressway and I change my course if there was. It's a test that's approved by all insurances. It should be done before any biopsy in my opinion. There's really no case. Sure, if the patient's PSA is a thousand, and you just need a tissue diagnosis, okay, that's not. Let's not bait that. But for every man who's undergoing routine screening for their prostate cancer, if they have an elevated PSA, they should get a reflex test, which includes for sure percent free PSA, prostate health index or 4K or other tests, depending on the cost. If those are abnormal, and by the way, typically insurance will approve those if the PSA is over about five, right? PSA over is PSA over four uh, for four K score. Okay, but we can we get PHI testing in our lab. They do it for us. It's covered by insurance at any Got it. value. Okay, yep. We it's very well calibrated over two. Yep. So we do it over two. 
And by the way, what I'm telling you is based off of a prospective randomized trial published in the New England Journal, where they used advanced PSA testing. They did not use 4K or, or, or PHI. They used Stockholm 3, which is a European-only test. Abnormal advanced PSA testing, do an MRI. If the MRI has a suspicious lesion, we'll talk about that in a second, perform a biopsy, not just of the lesion, but of the whole prostate. Reduce prostate biopsies by 50%. Enhance detection of clinically significant disease by 11%. So hello, like why are you not doing that? I don't know, but frankly, it happens all the time. So what is it? Okay, the blood test we talked about, yep. that provides more specificity to someone with an elevated PSA who may have a problem. That's all I tell people. It tells us we need to do the next step. That next step is a high resolution Google map of their prostate. That is a typically a 3T MRI. So three Tesla, so three Tesla. moderate power. Yes, and it doesn't need any like endorectal coil or anything. So a 3T magnet doing a prostate MRI because there's specific sequences and it's multi-parametric. The key um, you know, parameters that we look at, T2 images, you look at diffusion weighted imaging and dynamic contrast enhancement. Those are the three components of a multi-parametric MRI. However, there are great radiologists, scientists, you're friends with one of them, uh, Raj, who have and others have shown that you don't necessarily need, you don't the, need contrast, the contrast, right? And that a, on average, a T two uh, and the dynamic, the diffusion weighted imaging are nearly as good, not identical, but nearly as good at evaluating the prostate for any risky lesions. Now, is an MRI perfect? No, it misses prostate cancers. It will miss small, low grade prostate cancers. But like we'll talk about in a sec, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's how the test works. It's done and it's a screening tool to help us identify bulky, higher grade, higher risk tumors. Now, when you look at your um, MRI report, because as part of the 21st Century Cures Act, every patient can look at their entire medical record, you'll see that they'll give you, they'll give you a good, well done MRI. The report should contain the size of the prostate. Yep. And I, it's baked into our reports because when I came to Chicago, I said, we're going to do PSA density. So you get the density. And then it tells you if there's a suspicious lesion. And there's a degree of suspicion. It's called the RAD score, the PI RADs for prostate imaging RAD score. And it goes between one and five. One and two are considered to be BPH lesions. They're not cancer. So really, we worry about RADs threes, RADs fours, and RADs fives. And in general, most recommendations would be if you have a RADS 3, 4, 5 lesion in your prostate that, and you've never had a biopsy before, that you should consider a biopsy that samples the spot and systematically, that would be what we call target, and systematically samples the areas around the target, i.e. the peripheral zone in the area kind of mapped around that lesion. How easy is it for you to see this and make this determination. For example, when you look at the MRI and you see the lesion in presumably the peripheral zone, yes. how easy is it for you to then go and actually physically do the biopsy and know that you've hit it as opposed to miss it? Yeah, there's skill involved with with doing an MRI targeted biopsy. Are you biopsy. doing it under some sort of ultrasound guidance? Yes. So yeah, you have an ultrasound. So you use an ultrasound and ultrasounds are not great. Traditional standard ultrasounds, which are very high resolution, are not great at identifying lesions with the efficiency that a MRI is. And granted, they have time to think about and look at the images. So what we typically do is we take the MRI images and you either cognitively, i.e. with your brain or with the computer assistance, overlay the MRI and the suspicious area on the MRI with the real-time ultrasound. And is this a transrectal MRI you're doing? It's a transrectal ultrasound. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Transrectal ultrasound. Yes. yes. And then you're biopsying right beside the... Well, so that is how you overlay and you associate the suspicious area on the MRI is with the transrectal ultrasound overlay. Now, you can do the prostate biopsy one of two ways. One way is to, to again, pass the needle right alongside the... Um, 
ultrasound probe, that's a transrectal biopsy, that um, then you, you can follow the track of the needle as it goes in alongside the ultrasound probe through the rectal mucosa into the prostate. Mm. It's a very effective way to pick up prostate cancers. And the trial I talked about, that's the Stockholm 3 trial, that's the technique that they used. Now, the limitation of doing that is you, you always introduce a small amount of rectal, bacteria. rectal flora, bacteria from your rectum, into the prostate when the needle passes from the rectum into the prostate. And there's do any, men prophylactically take an antibiotic yeah. for that procedure? So to prep for that procedure, you'll do an enema to just decrease the volume of stool and bacteria in the rectum, and then you also will take an, an antibiotic. And with modern you know, antimicrobial prophylaxis, you can reduce infection after prostate biopsy to around, depending on the series, between one and 4%. Wow, so still pretty high. Yeah, it, it, it can be real. I mean, if you're the one in 100 or the four out of 100 guys, yeah. you know, that's a real issue. Now, that's all types of infections. So urosepsis, where you have, as we talked really about before, really severe with bacteria in your bloodstream, that's very rare. You know, but infections in general between one and four percent. The other approach that you can use is you can do um, a percutaneous biopsy. So the ultrasound probes in the rectum, mm -hmm. it's looking up at the prostate, but the needle is inserted percutaneously in the space in the skin through the skin in the space between the rectum and the scrotum. Okay. Okay. Yep. So that's usually around four to five centimeters of space. And in that space, you can actually place a guide, percutaneous needle guide. And then from that, you can then actually target the biopsy. So in other words, way. you're not pulling the needle in and out each time. You, you have- You are. Oh, you are. So you, you have a short needle guide, a trocar that goes through the skin so you can establish your trajectory. Yep. And then from there, you can, un with ultrasound guidance, put the needle exactly into the suspicious lesion. But you keep, you, the trocar stays in one time and you yes. just, yeah, okay. So you do one pass on the so right. So what's the drawback of that approach? Is it more difficult? One, yeah. So one pass on the right and one pass on the left. Now, the original way that we did prostate biopsies was, was with a percutaneous approach. Mm. So back in the old days, over 100 years ago, if you had a suspicious bump on your prostate, you'd make an incision there and you'd cut it out. You'd that was the original yeah. way that they did yeah. prostatectomies as well, That's right? That's right, exactly. So that approach to the prostate has been um, long appreciated. However, doing the prostate biopsy in a way that you could systematically sample the prostate with that approach has historically been very morbid because what they would do is they would place a grid like every two millimeters, two millimeter by two millimeter grid uh, along the perineum. And they would make between, let's say, 20 and 30 individual pokes into the perineum and into the prostate. That was how we, you can deliver radioactive seeds or radioactive pellets. Yeah. But that approach was also used to do biopsies. That results in significant edema and swelling in the prostate and significant bleeding. And urinary retention rates after that approach are very high, 15, 20%. Wow. And it's very painful. You can't do it awake. Yep. Okay. So there's a guy, Matt Alloway. He's a Schaefer family friend. He is a urologist in Western Maryland. Very innovative guy. And he said, there has to be a better way than doing transrectal, bringing bacteria into the prostate and there has to be a less painful way than doing this grid so he created this percutaneous approach where you can basically have a single trocar on the right go through the skin yep. single tro trocar on the left go through the skin and you can navigate and sample all areas of the prostate so he's been doing this for a decade now but you know and, and nod to him he's an entrepreneurial guy he created a company with his product and it's the kind of gold standard for how you do that today so what now, percentage that approach, of your biopsies are done with the trocar versus transrectally? I like the transperineal approach, but um, in, a, in a nod to just not adopting things without with closed eyes and saying it's better, we are in the midst of completing a 16 institution randomized trial that explores whether or not transperineal prostate biopsy is actually quote unquote better than transrectal prostate biopsy. And the primary endpoint is infection. So as I mentioned, Modern contemporary infections with transrectal between one and four percent. We think our approach to prevent infections transrectally is very good, and we're probably more on the one percent range. 
when we do a transperineal approach, and Matt Alloway's published a lot on this, you can do that without any antibiotics, and the infection rate is less than one in a thousand. Wow. So really, we're trying to say, you know. So you'll obviously, I mean, you're presumably powered to show a difference in that direction. It's a lot. The power is hard. So we 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 had a power calculation. The NCI reviewed our power calculations, and they gave they said this is the appropriate power to detect a difference. Um, so I think what will end up happening, and we're looking at the data right now, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say, but it, my sense is we're gonna have zero percent infections in TP transperineal prostate biopsy. But will we have done enough transrectals to dis, to really so statistically you. show a difference? However, in my will there mind, be secondary outcomes that yes. look at detection. Yes. So in my mind, if you have an approach that is zero percent infections. I don't care if it's one percent or you know point you know two percent. Yeah, still unless, a difference. unless you're losing detection. Yes. So the other endpoints for the study are pain mm -hmm. and side effects. As I mentioned, transperineal biopsy with the old grid approach was fifteen percent retention, the meaning old a catheter. Grid approach, yeah. You know, it's terrible. So we're looking at side effects. I think it's done properly. They're minimal, and then we use a lot of medication to do our blocks. So I'll, t I'll tell you a little anecdote. Like a about pedendal nerve block? Yeah, we something. do a pedendal nerve block, and we use lidocaine, and we don't just use any lidocaine. We use buffered lidocaine because uh, lidocaine, when it comes out of the vial, is a pH of about 5. Yep. So, you know, when you, you went put to Put a little bicarb in? Yeah. Yep. You know how you go to the doctor, they go pinch in a burn? Yeah. Well, what's the burn? The pH. pH. Yeah. <laughs> There's no more burn. So you, you put buffered lidocaine with the transperineal approach. We're gonna We're looking at the data now, but it's... I mean, there's some discomfort, but it's it's tolerable in the office awake. And then the most important thing, of course, is cancer detection. Yep. So we have 16 centers. Um, there's two other ongoing trials, not to just say that we're the only one. There's a trial out of a limited number of centers in, out of Syracuse. They finished their study. Um, they're looking to get their paper published. And then there's a large paper publication, large study in, in the UK. But we're going to be the first to publish a multi-center large prospective trial, and it'll be interesting. I, I think that it will show that A, um, TP biopsies is 0%. It will show that um, they're slightly more uncomfortable, um, and, that, and then the cancer detection we have yet to fully analyze, but excited to do that. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of results that one gets from the biopsy. You've yeah. already mentioned the word Gleason. Let's talk about what that means and what the scores, uh, how, how the scores are determined and, and what the implications are. Yeah, so you, when you do a biopsy, you systematically, you first sample the targeted part. Let's, let's just do one thing before we talk about this. So who needs a prostate biopsy? As, uh, yeah, that, who needs a prostate biopsy? Somebody who has abnormal blood testing, they go on to get an MRI. Now, that's our regular pathway. Who do we say you don't need an MRI? Men who have bilateral hip replacements, an MRI is effectively useless. So we don't do an MRI for those individuals. We can calculate PSA density with an ultrasound. And it's fast, it's cheap, it's effective. Otherwise, people are go. We we have everyone go to an MRI. It's worth it that Even much. Even with a single hip replacement. Single hip. Our radiologists are really good, and a good radiologist can read an MRI effectively with a single hip. If somebody has profound anxiety and they need general anesthesia for something, we'll be nuanced about whether or not we think an MRI makes sense. But for the average person, ninety nine point five percent of people, you know, you get an MRI now. MRI shows a suspicious lesion. Three, four, or five on the pyrads. Rats, three, four, or five, you need a biopsy. MRI shows... Sorry, independent of PSA density? Independent of PSA density. Okay. If your MRI shows um, no lesion, but a high PSA density, so a young man, let's say under 60, that's a PSA density of more than 0.1 or 0.12. Yep. If you're older, I'll give you a little bit more of a le longer leash, and we'll say 0.15 over 65 or 70. If you have a PSA density that's below that threshold, and you have a high PSA, low percent free, et cetera, you need a biopsy in my opinion, okay? We're gonna include, Ted, the slide that you shared with me a couple months ago that I still have, I still look at it all the time yeah. now, which shows 
by pi rads, by PSA density, yes. the outcome of biopsies. That's right. And it's mind boggling. Yes. So PSA density is a huge variable in terms of impacting probability of having cancer when you sample a suspicious lesion yep. and or the volume or bulk of that particular aggressiveness of that particular lesion. So RADS 3, 4, or 5, you need, a, you need a biopsy unless your PSA density is incredibly low. Like 0.02. Yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, patient, we... They, sometimes they have it, yes. So there's, there's, ne there's never always, and there's never nevers in medicine, right? Yep. But in general, that was what we would say. If you have a negative MRI and a, and a, and a high PSA density, you, we will often suggest a biopsy for you. And if you have, um, and if you have a um, negative MRI and a low PSA density, we'll say you're likely can be monitored. Yep. Now, we'll put in the show links a nice figure that illustrates that from a large group of uh, about 10 institutions pooling all of their MRI and biopsy data together. However, I have the for good fortune of having a, a partner who's a brilliant guy. He t analyzed- This is Ashley. Ashley Ross. Mm -hmm. He analyzed and built a neural network real-time predictor for all patients, not just Northwestern medicine patients, but we used all the Northwestern medicine patients in our system who had had PHI, MRI, and a biopsy and looked at all their outcomes. So there's some selection bias because we didn't include people who didn't have a biopsy, but in general, we took all these people and we created a neural network real-time predictor for what's your absolute risk for having prostate cancer in general, but more specifically, prostate cancers that would require treatment. And that we'll put in the show links. That is a super powerful this tool. This is the model. This is the my you, 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 risk calculator. Okay, so yeah. we'll make sure we link so that So the as figure well. is great because it just gives you an idea of a framework, but the actual risk calculator gives the individual patient their individualized risk. So he built it off around 16, 1700 MRI biopsy linked cases, but now that has grown because it's, it's always learning. Now, if you undergo a prostate biopsy, it's not just, the answer is not just cancer, yes or no. There's a lot of subtlety and a lot of things have changed about how we think about these different cancers. So I always explain to patients that it's basic effectively when a pathologist looks at a biopsy sample under the microscope, they're describing the pattern of the, of the cancer gland. We talked about this at the beginning, the prostate is an exocrine gland that produces semen. And there's an architecture of the gland or the duct that a normal prostate has. So think about like a branching tree. When you develop a cancer, it's an abnormal developed branch. And so the pathologist will score how abnormally developed that duct or that branch is. And that score is what ends up being the Gleason score. Now the pathologist tells us if you have a cancer, what does the individual branch look like? What's the pattern? That would be the Gleason pattern. And then the patterns today are pattern three, pattern four, and pattern five. But what we get in the summation report is, well, how much pattern three cancer do you have? How much pattern four cancer do you have? And how much pattern five cancer do you have? And that's the Gleason sum, or what we now call, what was also referred to as the Gleason score. So the common ones would be three plus three equals six. That means that the pathologist only saw abnormal glandular patterns that were pattern three. So the pathologist is always reporting the highest scores that they see? They're reporting the most common pattern they see first. That's the first number. Okay. And then the second most common pattern of cancer that they see as number two. Okay. okay. And this is on both sides. They once they're looking at they this, they take the every single sample. They tell you the score. Okay. So and typical number of samples that should be done in a decent biopsy. It's twelve systematics. Okay. So that's right side, left side, kind of every five millimeters kind of approach. Plus you sample the target, and the recommendation number of samples of a target is usually three. So two is inadequate because the needle can bend. It can deflect. Sometimes the needle is, is going in 20 centimeters beyond your hand. So you have to account for the deflection and you can track it. But the idea is you do it three times. I mean, talk about user error potential, right? Like think about the difference between you and me doing a prostate biopsy. It's like 
I mean, I know you could do it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but like it, it requires even skill. within the field yeah. of urology, like there has to be a difference in skill. Yeah, and that's what the training is part of. And and Ashley and I actually host a course where we put on and, and train anybody who's interested in how to do a proper, good transperineal prostate biopsy, for example. Because that's oh, a hopefully new, this is a just new technology. limited to physicians. Yeah, so it'll it'll be helpful. And obviously, um, you know, there is a skill involved with and. And you can tell there's a skill involved with doing the biopsy and there's a skill involved by the pathologist when they report it out. So the requirements or the recommendations are that you declare the Gleason score. That's the sum of the most common and the second most common cancer. Now, presumably, um, some of these core samples come back with no cancer yeah. in them. And is it's, that just reported as nothing? They it's, report no cancer. Okay, got it. So it's no cancer or at at best, 3-3. Three, three. Yes. Well, they'll... so. No cancer. Some, there's some rare variants that are not cancer and they're not benign. They'll tell us about them. That would be like prosthetic atypia. But that's uncommon, especially in the era of MRI targeted biopsies only. Okay. And, and so I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. And you're biopsying only the peripheral zone? You Well, we biopsy where the lesion is, but most prostate cancers originate in the peripheral zone. They can invade. But the 12 systematic biopsies peripheral zone. peripheral zone. A How big, thick is that, by the way? It depends on the size of the prostate. So in a young man, it's about um, four to five millimeters thick. And in, in a guy who has a big prostate, let's say a hundred gram prostate, the total peripheral zone volume does not change in a man over time. So does that mean it actually gets thinner? Is it the gets compressed and thinned out particularly if you have benign prosthetic overgrowth. Wow. So, so it makes the, it harder to biopsy. It makes it harder to biopsy. Absolutely. So that's where skill definitely plays a role. So you have to really understand what you're doing. I mean, you know, not any, you know, it's not like anybody can. I mean, this is not to take away from breast biopsies and things like that, but this is, a, or a thyroid biopsy, but this is a totally different. Totally different. This is much more complicated. In my opinion, yes, for sure. Because it's not like you're just, you know, Sure, a uh, thyroid or breast, you're trying to target the a a abnormal, but we're, yeah. yes, there's a lot of subtlety to it. You have to know what you're doing. And yes, the total peripheral zone volume remains the same over time. So if your prostate size increases, the air, the actual, the thickness of that peripheral zone goes way down. Yeah. In other words, another way to just get this back to our analogy is you're having to biopsy the skin of the orange. Yes. And if it's a small orange, the skin is a certain thickness, which is yeah. relatively thin. The bigger the orange gets, you have to preserve the amount of skin so the skin gets thinner and thinner yeah, and thinner. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So now what do you do with these Gleason scores? So you take a look at them and you say, what is the score? And then what's the distribution and what's the volume of the score? Because the two things matter in terms of determining what the next steps for the patient are. In general, the way I talk through pa this with patients is, you know, did your biopsy demonstrate prostate cancer? And if it demonstrated prostate cancer, is it the kind of prostate cancer that we need to treat right now? Or is it the kind of prostate cancer that we can safely follow or monitor over time? Okay, so let's start with patient comes in, both the lesion and the periphery are 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. So if somebody, so Gleason, six prostate cancer, that's Gleason three plus three equals six prostate cancer, is the least aggressive type of prostate cancer when you look at it under the microscope. And it has a very favorable prognosis, meaning um, those prostate cancers, the thought process should be, um, I need to find some data that will convince me that this cancer requires treatment because the recommendation on average is that these cancers can be monitored. Now, what are the variables that affect whether or not we think someone should have their cancer treated? Sorry, just to make sure I understand that, Ted. Does that mean a three plus three can't spread or metastasize unless it progresses to a three, four, for example? Good, excellent question. And that's been explored um, with one major caveat. That is that it's been explored in surgical series. So in individuals, so there's a biopsy. Who, there's a there's a there's a bias already introduced. Huge there. bias. Yeah. But if you look at radical prostatectomy series in men um, who had Gleason six prostate cancer, um, there's a large series by John Epstein at Hopkins and also Scott Egner at University of Chicago. They both showed that there was no lymph node metastasis 
in men with Gleason 6 prostate cancer. So just make sure we understand that. Any man who underwent a prostatectomy with a Gleason 3 plus 3 had lymph node negative disease and yes. therefore by extension, presumably, they never went on to get metastatic. They never had a recurrence. They, they never had, at the time of their surgery, uh, never had... So what's the longitudinal lethal. data on those folks? Do we know that they're free? Well, of they disease? do very well. They're like the probability that they would die from prostate cancer is very, very low, but they could have a local recurrence, for example, and okay. that could result in subsequent problems and need for additional secondary therapies. Okay. But on average, we know that a Gleason 6 prostate cancer that is of low volume can be safely monitored because But it hang on a second. Why did those men have cancer surgery then? Because we have evolved how we manage them. I see. So based and, on those data, we yeah. now would be less That likely. was the person that I operated on. We operated on Hopkins when I was training, where one core Gleason 6. We thought because they had a cancer that they required immediate treatment. But, okay. So this, is, so this is now very different very from different. the colorectal cancer model. Yeah. In colorectal cancer, you have an adenomatous polyp. It comes out. You have a yes. carcinoma in situ, it comes out. Yeah, the difference is because in the colorectal model, you can easily resect the adenomatous polyp with minimal or no side effects. I see. So done it's the with the colonoscopy. Yeah, it's the morbidity of the prostatectomy. Similarly, in the breast, right? DCIS, it's coming out. You know, debate whether we should radiate or not. But yes. We treat pre cancer so aggressively in these other organs. Yes. And here, but in that, in that way, in the positive light of things, urologists have been very progressive and have been at the forefront of doing surveillance for tumors that have not yet established or declared that they have lethal potential. So how often do you get a man, Ted, uh, or maybe let me reframe it this way, for every 100 men who you see who have a Gleason 3 plus 3, how many say, Dr. Schaefer, I understand what you just said about the data. I don't want this thing in me. Take it out. Yeah. I mean, it's rare that I will offer my surgical services to that person because um, there's a lot of new, and sometimes the patients don't fully understand what the potential ramifications for their side effects may be. Meaning so, the, ri the surgical risks. Yeah. yeah. Or radiation risks. Yeah. So what I will do is I will do, a, I will jump, jump through a lot of hoops to look for reasons to reassure that that patient that they do not have an aggressive lethal situation and most of the time we're successful now so, so a man is diagnosed with gleason 6 prostate cancer if it is of low volume let's call that between one and four cores which is the most common thing that we would find okay and that one or four samples of a systematic biopsy or if you target a lesion on the MRI, we consider that just to be one region. So if you did five samples of an MRI suspicious RADS4 lesion and all five samples came out Gleason 6, we would just call that one area of visible cancer. In those situations, we, we generally would say, you are somebody who is a candidate who can have their prostate cancer followed because at this time, your tumor does not have the lethal potential to spread to your lymph nodes or other parts of your body and all kinds of therapy to treat it carry more morbidity than just leaving it in place and just monitoring it. Yeah, it's amazing. And you're right, it's really precision medicine. Well, but, yeah. But you have to be, both as the patient and the physician, you have to have a very high degree of certainty that you didn't miss a four. Yeah, that so- there's not a, That, so that we wasn't don't, a three yeah, plus four. So patients will often say that to me, and I will tell them, so for the average patient, uh, look, we don't just assume that you only had six. Although remember, with MRI-targeted biopsies, yeah, the, we know the chances of reclassification or change in the grade of the tumor at the time of prostatectomy is low, like 10%. Historically, when you and I were residents at Hopkins, you'd have a guy like the Gleason 6 and he'd come out with the Gleason 8 because there was no MRI and there was no MRI targeting. So the uh, precision that's of the- That's a very interesting point. The so precision, the pathologist, when he gets to slice and dice the thing yeah. in his, yeah. So the precision of the biopsy today is much better, and therefore we can provide More much confidence. better assurance to the patient that, hey, we think we, the biopsy shows a six, we got a pretty good idea, you just got a six, okay? Yep. Now, that again, doesn't mean that that patient's um, 
we just assume that they're going to be fine for the rest of their life. We do active, intensive monitoring. Yeah. That's PSA testing every six months. I still believe that, like you were mentioning before, following that PSA and if it changes closely is helpful. And then we do- Do you repeat the MRI independent of a change in PSA in those patients once they're a three plus three? I do. My general frequency would be um, that if they've had an MRI pre-biopsy, pre then I'll track them. Depending what their if their PSA is stable, I will not repeat the biopsy. We recommend we recommend a confirmatory biopsy at one year. Okay, sure. so you have low volume, low grade prostate cancer. We check your PSA at six months; it's stable, everything looks good. Your MRI was not concerning. We'll do a biopsy for you at one year. If you come in with low grade prostate cancer, like the patients we took care of twenty five years ago at Hopkins, and you have not had an MRI before your biopsy you immediately get an MRI because I want to know what else is going on in there. I want to know your density and I want to know if there's a lesion that was missed. If on that by that MRI, right, that I get after your initial diagnosis has a RADS four or five, you go to immediate biopsy. If the MRI shows that you have a RADS three, but let's say a really, really high PSA density. Like again, I have concerns that the biopsy quality was poor you go to immediate biopsy. So again, you want to do confirmation to establish that you, you your, your north is your true north before you tell a patient, yes, 100% I endorse active surveillance, okay? Yep. So we do a lot, lot, lot of testing in these individual patients to make sure that when we're recommending surveillance, we're recommending it for low volume, low grade prostate cancer, okay? Again, if you can answer this, all things equal, for 100 patients who show up with suspicious enough PSA that they buy a MRI, yeah. suspicious enough RADS 345 that they buy a biopsy, but now high degree of confidence they're 3 plus 3, meaning they're down the active surveillance pathway, what percentage of those men, and I'm sure it's age dependent, will go the rest of their life without a prostatectomy? I can't tell you the answer to that, but I can tell you data that's 10 or 15 years out. Okay. So, and five years out. So, if you have Gleason 6 prostate cancer and you enroll in active surveillance, the question, of course, is well, what would be the trigger to recommend a treatment? Yep. Okay. So, it's effectively like your cancer is becoming more aggressive or you are just have a proliferation of a very, your tumor becomes bulky. Okay. Mm. So, think about it that those two ways. The chances that you would have a more aggressive cancer develop in the first five years of surveillance is 12.5%. Okay. Okay. By the way, is that independence of whether you're a RADS 345? We didn't really it's talk about comers. that. It's all comers. Okay. All comers. So this is Ballantyne Carter's active surveillance cohort from Johns Hopkins. From Hopkins. 1996, he started it. Yep. 12.5% chance in the first, that you'd have a change in the grade of your cancer. Overall, about 30 to 35% of men in the first five years of entering surveillance will go on to subsequently have definitive treatment, okay? So about 12.5% of guys, it's because there's a change in the grade. It becomes more aggressive looking. And the other guys, a variety of factors. They have uh, increasing bulkiness of their tumor. They may develop concomitant urinary symptoms, and they want it all addressed at one time, et cetera, et cetera. In general, I tell people it's 12.5% chance that you have a, really need to do something because there's a change in the grade. That's pretty steady and pretty consistent. It's around 2 3% risk annually. And it, that, that holds for 10 years as well. Okay. Meaning you add 2 or 3% yeah. per year after five. Yeah. So you're up to 22, 25. Yeah. But overall, if I told people there's a one in five chance that your tumor would become more aggressive over the next 10 years of your life and you need treatment, yeah, they'd most still, people they'd sit on that. I think that's fair to. I yeah. think it's a fair. I think that's a reasonable frequency or well, especially chance. because you're not saying go away and we'll only that's see exactly you again right. when you're in trouble. It's like that's we're going to exactly watch right. that progress. That's right. And what's the chance that a cancer progresses in surveillance to be uncurable? It's one. It's point one percent. So one in a thousand guys who you're monitoring would have a fisherian event yep. okay so wow okay that's bell that's bell carter's data 
Ballantyne right. Carter out of Johns Hopkins. It has changed how we treat and think about prostate cancer from when we were training there to now. So let's talk about the Gleason 7s. Yeah. So again, a pathologist, um, a pathologist will tell us what they see under the microscope. How much pattern 3 do you have? How much pattern 4 you have? And if you have pattern 5, do you have it? So a Gleason 7, as you said, again, the Gleason score is a Gleason sum, and it tells how much pattern 3 and how much pattern 4 do you have. So it is a blended scotch, not a single malt or whatever mm. they call it, okay? And the blend is what matters the most. How much pattern four you have particularly is the most important factor. So you can have as little as less than 5% pattern four and as much of, as much as 99% pattern four. If you have 100% pattern four, you don't have a Gleason seven. You're up to eight. You have an eight, okay? So when I look at a pathology report, I look at what is the percentage of pattern four there, right? It tells me two things. One, how good was the pathologist when he, who read it? Because if he's not telling me percent pattern four, I don't believe anything he's telling me, right? And two, if it's there, how much percent pattern four you have, not just by percentage, but millimeters, right? Mm. So I'll look at how long is the tumor. Remember our biopsy needle is 15 millimeters long. What gauge? It's a uh, true cut biopsy around a 18, 16 gauge. Okay. It's not a small, it's a decent yep. sized sample. Length of the tumor, and then I translate, well, how much of that length is percent pattern four? Okay, so hmm. if I have a patient who has a single biopsy core that has 10% prostate cancer, that's 1.5 millimeters of prostate cancer, and that, that and he has 5% pattern four. Think about how little disease that is that has potential issues with lethality. What I do with that sample is I send it off to Verisite for decipher testing and I have them look because about 70% of the time, those small volume Gleason 7 tumors genomically are minimally aggressive. But I, mm. wanted to, I wanted to delineate that. So they behave more like the sixes. They behave like a six. But if you have more millimeters of pattern four, the more millimeters of pattern four you have on your biopsy in total, in sum, the more that would push you to do treatment. So big picture, if you're exclusively patterns three disease, on average, we think surveillance until proven otherwise. If you have a smidge, of pattern four, I'm talking about one millimeter, two millimeters in total. We think, okay, maybe surveillance would work for this person. We have a very thorough, detailed discussion, age, other issues in their life, et cetera, et cetera. And we determine, okay, life expectancy. So if you're 75 and you have two millimeters of pattern four and you, you know, you're an average US male, maybe you don't need to aggressively treat at that time. You need to aggressively monitor, but don't need aggressive treatment. Yeah. So that, that's the subtlety to it. But the higher the percentage of pattern four you have, and therefore on average, the more millimeters of pattern four you have, the more I'm, you're gonna be talking about active treatment. So that's the essence of how much prostate cancer management has changed in the last five years. And a Gleason 7 that needs treatment is a perfect surgical candidate. Yes. Okay, what about a Gleason 8? Now, by definition, every single thing that is looked at is four. Yeah. I guess, is there such a thing as a three, five? There is a three, five, and it's been well, you know, the, the science geeks have looked at it. Effectively, it behaves like a four, four, eight. Okay, so let's just talk about- You treat the them pure. all the same. And you treat anything that's an eight or higher the same way. So you can have a only pattern four. You can have a um, only pattern four. You can have a, Pattern four plus pattern five, that would be a Gleason nine. nine. Okay, you can have a 10, that's pretty rare, but pretty bad. And actually, if you're pattern four, three, seven, okay, so if you're more than 50% pattern four, mm -hmm. your Gleason four plus three equals seven, we generally bundle those together with the eights and the nines. You have a lot of pattern four, you need treatment, okay? And then the discussion be becomes whether or not single modality treatment is effective at treating and curing that individual man of their prostate cancer. We're talking about the Gleason 8 on average. Yes. Yep. 
Why? Because the analogy I always use is like a dandelion weed on your front lawn. The higher the Gleason score, the higher the probability that that person can have deep roots in their tumor, extending outside the prostate, potentially into the perirectal fat and beyond. And additionally, you have a higher probability that that dandelion can go to seed and those seeds can float off to the lymph nodes. Okay? So when you have a higher grade prostate cancer, you need to do a couple different things in your workup. The thing that you need to do, the one key thing is to do a PET PSMA scan. PSMA is a prostate specific antigen, prostate specific membrane antigen specific particularly, that is enriched in its expression in prostate cancer cells. And it is the most uh, sensitive and specific way to determine the extent of a person who has high grade prostate cancer's disease. So you need to stage them. So in other words, it's a PET scan, but instead of using FDG, it yes. uses PSMA, PSMA, specific radioligand, because prostate tumors are not FDG avid. Okay. Okay. So you do a PET scan. So it's scan. a functional metabolic test yeah. as well. You stage somebody's uh, prostate cancer with a PSMA scan, and then from there you develop a treatment plan. On average, if you have prostate area only, let's just call it prostate only, could be extra prostatic, but prostate only, or prostate plus lymph nodes, then you have to start thinking about your initial definitive therapy and potentially multimodal therapies to um, more, uh, more uh, aggressively treat an aggressive lesion. So depending on the patient, their age, the bulk of their tumor, et cetera, I will talk to people about radical prostatectomy as an option for them. There are a select group of people, let's call it 20 to 25% of my surgical practice that presents with very bulky, potentially you know, super bulky aggressive lesions. In those individuals, I'll have an upfront conversation that I don't think that surgery alone will be effective at completely curing you of your prostate cancer, but vis-a-vis -vis breast cancer treatment, colorectal cancer treatment, surgery is an important component of your initial therapy and we'll do surgery and we'll follow that up with the radiation based approach. And that patient that you're describing, they have bulky tumor, but the PET scan doesn't reveal any activity in the bone. Correct. Does prostate cancer metastasize to places outside of the bone besides the local invasion? Lymph nodes is the most common place it would metastasize. But within the to. basin and, and in the. Yes, it, 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 it follows a Halsteadian trajectory most of the time, i.e. But pelvic does it follow para-aortic lymph nodes yeah. the way testicular does? Yeah. So it can go to lung? It can be in the thorac thoracic cavity, yes, mediastinum. I see. Yeah. Okay. S you know, supraclavicular. So, so yeah, and then it will go to bone. That's the- uh, uh, Why bone? There's a lot of uh, the microenvironment of the bone that's thought to mimic the microenvironment of the, uh, of the prostate. And so that's one are there, are there androgen receptors there? No, but the milieu that the other growth factors that prostates may need to grow are there. Number one. Number two, as you know, the bone marrow filters all your blood. So if you have circulating tumor cells, you know, they're going to be trapped in the... But isn't it interesting how, how few cancers do that besides breast and, breast and prostate? Breast and prostate. Yeah. Uh, you know, like think about colon cancer. Yeah. Uh, prostate, you know, uh, pardon me, pancreatic cancer. I mean, all of these other cancers. Yeah, I mean, the the colon one, I think, is that we just pick up advanced colon cancers while they're, you know, they're trapped in their kind of mesenteric blood spread, right? So you're picking them up regionally more, right? Yeah, it might, you know, yeah, you're right. It might just be that but, the colon is so concentrated towards the liver. Yeah, I mean, the 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 load of circulating tumor cells in colon are filtered by the liver. Yeah. But the, again, it's and, not uncommon to see colon go to lung too. Yeah. I mean, prostate goes to lung, prostate goes just everywhere else. But yes, it is true. Lymph node is the most common site of metastasis and then effectively equivalent or just in a close second is bone. From a staging perspective, do we use typical TNM staging for prostate cancer? We and do. if so, the if it's only in the lymph nodes, is it considered, uh, it's considered an, N1, stage an four. N1? Oh, oh yeah. it is for, TN for TNM, it's for AJCC, that would be stage four at diagnosis if it's in pelvic lymph nodes. I got it. So even though it's M0, is that considered M0 or yeah, M1? Is. We call that regional. Yeah, but it's stage four. Yeah. Okay. And it's scary to have someone have stage four, but 
prostate cancer in the pelvic lymph nodes is still curable. How, how curable? Uh, it, de <laughs> it depends. Um, the devil's in the details. It depends on, again, the big differences in prostate cancer overall for the listeners, 96, 95, 96% of prostate cancers are diagnosed when they're localized. Okay. Then there are people who have N1 disease and M1 disease, and you can have M1A, M1B. It's just the extent of the metastasis. If you have lymph node only disease, it's rare, but if it's picked up at the time of your initial diagnosis, it's less curable than if you're, you subsequently develop lymph node disease as a, in your follow-up in your survivorship monitoring. In general, I would say that, um, yeah, a, a vast majority of people who have lymph node only disease can live 10 years and are they cured or not? That's debatable. We have this blood test that tells us exactly what's going on, but they can live 10 years. And the treatment is prostatectomy plus radiation, typically? Well, the treatment, the best treatment, if you look at the data, there's never been a randomized trial that explores which one's better, but the best way to control lymph node disease is probably with radiation. Now, I think about what's the role of surgery in this space. The role of surgery is to debulk the bulky tumor. As we talked about, a lymph node med is probably 40 or 50 million cells at a minimum. And so why not enable the radiation to be more effective by just debulking it? But on average, radiation is more effective at controlling the local, that local disease extent than is surgery. The morbidity of radiation is not trivial, um, not just from the nausea and the sickness that can come from the treatment, but at least in the few cases I've seen of patients many years out, um, the rectal bleeding um, yeah. that the normally gets better, but not always, right? Yeah. So there are the main side effects when you're considering treatment with radiation would be urinary, sexual, and then kind of GI. Okay. And GI meaning rectal, rectal irritation, rectal bleeding. The um, urinary side effects with radiation on average are kind of, you know, you're burning the prostate. So you're going to have these lower urinary tract symptoms that we talked mm. about at the beginning of the podcast. They're always intensified and amplified. They typically persist for the duration of the treatment plus about a two month lag after that. The, um, the rectal side effects that you're describing, I think are mostly historical why there are, there's a lot of new technologies that have been used to really minimize that. So you can put in place with the percutaneous approach, like we talked about for the biopsies, you can percutaneously deposit the radiation seeds. gel, no gel, hydrogel. When it warms up, it thickens. You put it in the plane between the prostate and the rectum, and you elevate the prostate between five and 10 millimeters off the rectal wall. Mm. And it gives the radiation oncologist this window clear target to, to radiate the prostate effectively without um, damaging the rectum. Mm. And it reduces side effects substantially. Now, the other newest and most exciting kind of way to deliver radiation is with MRI guidance. So remember, historically, you are placing fiducial little gold seeds and you kind of line up the radiation and you just assume it was going to hit the prostate most of the time. And then we've developed kind of CT guided radiation where you do a quick CT scan. And for that day, you line up the radiation fields with the CT scan, but it's not real time. Mm. Now there is MRI guided um, prostate uh, radiation. So again, we do MRIs to see prostate cancers because it's way more resolution, not CT scans. So you can yeah. theoretically resolve to the prostate much better. And now there's a single um, MRI guided radi a linear accelerator that does intrafractional modifications of the dosage based on subtle movements, right? So if you take a deep breath or there's a little rectal gas, yep. it will capture it within between the fractions of radiation delivered and alter the trajectory of the beam. And that trial, there's a, there's a trial called the Mirage study. It was done at UCLA, and they showed that there was, you know, there's almost zero rectal side effects from it. That's the great other really, really cool thing about radiation is that when you have an a um, when you have an MRI and you have a big RADS lesion, let's say you got a RADS four, RADS five, um, you theoretically can boost 
that lesion with tr tremendous precision if you have MRI guided a linear accelerator. Because it's so visible on yeah. MRI. So the field of radiation oncology is evolving and they're doing a lot of spectacular things. One, this kind of real-time gating is huge. Two, um, using and boosting the MRI visible lesions is I think huge from a cancer control perspective. Mm. And then from a patient morbidity perspective, because the MRI linear accelerators are very expensive. They're not, we have one, but they're not widely available. You can do this uh, space OAR, that's the gel that basically separates yep. the prostate from the rectum. And that's been shown to reduce the toxicity of radiation treatment a lot. Hmm. It's good. You know what, it raises the field and the competition for us to think about ways to do better, less morbid prostatectomies. I guess to close the loop on that, let's talk about systemic therapy. Yep. Uh, the mainstay of this is androgen deprivation therapy. Right. Uh, we've already kind of talked about the morbidity of that. Yes. Um, are there other synthetic agents? Are there any things that are looking promising on the immunotherapy front? We're yeah. seeing an enormous... Uh, surge of that on the on the side of other epithelial tumors. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about let's talk about the first thing, which is when you're doing localized therapy, we do we do think about utilizing um, androgen deprivation therapy as a radiation sensitizer. Okay. So it is known that when you have a higher grade tumor, let's just say you have a Gleason eight or nine, like we talked about that radiation alone is not gonna effectively cure that patient of their prostate cancer. So you need to get, you need to deliver, and we know you can deliver radiation sensitization with androgen deprivation. Androgen deprivation induces double-strand DNA breaks. That's the whole purpose of radiation itself, is to induce those breaks. So you can- So in other words, androgen deprivation makes the cells even more, more susceptible, susceptible to, to the, the radiation. radiation treatment. So we use that routinely. And one of the things that the radongs have to work on, and they're doing, there's a series of trials right now exploring this, is either intensifying the androgen deprivation in cases that are very aggressive, or de-intensifying androgen deprivation in cases that maybe that the patient would not benefit from it. And the way that they're determining that is with the decipher test. So, so we use androgen deprivation therapy typically uh, in two spaces. One, to augment and enhance the results of radiation-based treatments, and two, in individuals who have more advanced prostate cancers. So mm -hmm. for individuals who are considering are going to have radiation for their localized or locally aggressive prostate cancers, they will often get that with a course of androgen deprivation. And the course of androgen deprivation typically ranges between six and 24 months depending on the bulk of the tumor and the aggressiveness or Gleason score of the tumor. That ADT was typically delivered with an LHRH agonist, okay? So you would give an LHRH agonist, it would eventually, first you get a surge in testosterone, and then it shuts the system down. The problem with that is that it is very, very um, durable. It lasts, a, it's a given as a, a depot that lasts a long time. It's helpful for the patient. But the probability that the patient would rec ever recover normal testosterone is very low. Less than 50% of men who do... Uh, Why is that? Because of the long-term effects on the hypothalamic pituitary axis. It just gets shut down. And or because, as you know, in the aging male, that, that, that whole... You know, it's fragile to begin with. It's fragile to begin with. Yeah. So... The good news for men who are getting ADT short course is that there are oral LHRH antagonists that are out there. And so they're a pill, so their half-life is much shorter. And they have been shown to effectively suppress testosterone to the same levels as an LHRH um, agonist. But their half-life is so short that people can have a rapid testosterone recovery. And they do. So for people who are going to get radiation treatment, mm who need a radiation sensitizer with ADT, we will typically use an oral, um, an oral LHRH antagonist because it's rapid on and rapid off. So good news for those individuals. Now, for individuals who are diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer that progresses to a metastatic state, or individuals who are diagnosed with um, prostate cancer that's metastatic at the time of diagnosis, those individuals need to go on systemic therapy. And the mainstay of systemic therapy is 
androgen deprivation or ADT. And that that is based off of Nobel Prize winning work from Charles Huggins out of University of Chicago. That mainstay of therapy has not changed. What has changed is the other alternate uh, you know, uh, synthetic molecules that we use in addition to traditional LH, RH agonists or antagonists to further suppress testosterone levels. And the two main classes of those are CYP17 inhibitors. That's a molecule called abiraterone. So as you alluded to, uh, androgens are made from cholesterol molecules and you can, you can inhibit a specific enzyme in the um, androgenic you know, pathway, CYP17, and you can then prevent production of not just testosterone, but other androgens not just in the testicle, but within the adrenal glands and systemically. And it results in a more profound, deeper suppression of testosterone androgen production. That is now recommended as first-line therapy for people with metastatic prostate cancer. What, what is the five-year survival for men with metastatic prostate cancer at diagnosis with and without ADT? Well, if you're metastatic at diagnosis, the five-year survival is probably... Let me ask that a better way. What's the median survival for men diagnosed with metastatic cancer to bone? Let's talk about distant metastases um, with and without ADT. What I'm really getting at is given the morbidity of ADT, are there men who say, okay, my median survival, if I do nothing, is 12 months, versus my median survival is 16 months. If I do ADT, yeah. it might not be worth an extra four yeah. months of life if yeah. I have to live sans yeah. androgens. The median survival for someone with newly diagnosed prostate cancer that refuses treatment is probably on the order of two to three years. Okay. The median survival for somebody who goes on traditional ADT only, LHRH agonist antagonist, is between 48 and 50 months. So you can double so it. So four years. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you're add, you can add a year to two years of life. Yes. But it's also the quality of the life of the individual. There are effects that occur um, in terms of the impact on metabolic syndrome and overall health. But remember, when prostate cancer is metastatic, it starts taking over your bone marrow. You can develop aplastic anemia. I mean, it's, it, it's brutal. So if you can mitigate that, I still think... How, how do men die? What, what are the final stages of life? Pathologic fracture, aplastic anemia because of bone marrow replacement. Mm. So it's other organ dysfunction because the, the tumor takes over for it. Renal failure is a classic one too yeah. from local tumor. So, and tumor lysis and things like yeah. that. Yeah. You can take, you can extend, you, ballpark you can effectively extend the life of a patient when if they're diagnosed with metastatic cancer like two years by about two to three years by going on ADT. The new agents, um, meaning abiraterone or this other class of agents, which are um, their competitive uh, binders of, of uh, androgen receptor. So they will bind androgen receptor, tether it in the cytosol and prevent it, the, the ligand binding domain from binding the, the DNA in the, in the nucleus, among other, meth, uh, other mechanisms. Those are things like enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolutamide. They're related. They're much more evolved cousins to finasteride mm. and dutasteride, okay? But they're very potent. So there's abiraterone, and then there's another class of, of novel hormonal therapies, the amides, enza, dero, and apa. They will effectively extend the life of a patient an additional 24 months on average compared to just traditional ADT alone. And they're done in concert? They're or, done together. Yeah. Correct. So now if you have someone with newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer, median survivals are seven to eight years, which is good. Now it depends a little bit on the situation that they're diagnosed with cancer in. So if you're newly diagnosed de novo metastatic versus you had your prostate cancer treated and then you develop metastatic, those two men have different outcomes. The men who are newly diagnosed de novo, they have a much shorter life expectancy, three to five years, compared to somebody who is um, already had their cancer treated, it progressed to the bone or, or, the, or the lymph nodes, they have a much longer life expectancy on average, probably because of bulk of disease and you know, mm. somewhat lead time bias in terms of the detection.
you know. So those are, so traditional androgen deprivation, then you have novel hormonal therapies. They're always evolving newer ones. The amides, they have some toxicities. Enzalutamide and apalutamide, they have kind of uh, issues with seizures. They have issues with um, kind of overall um, sleepiness and, and, and kind of alertness. And mm -hmm. so they're real. Ap uh, Daralutamide, which is the newest agent in that family, is much cleaner. There's less kind of cognitive effect of it. And there's, since it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier very well, no seizure side effects. Abiraterone is pretty well tolerated, but it has an effect on al aldosterone production. So you have to monitor people's blood pressures while you have them on those drugs. So there are toxicities with the treatment, but on average, people can have a longer lifespan and a relatively good health span while on these medications. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about surgical therapy. Yeah. Um, last time we spoke, we spoke in great length about the evolution of this operation from the way you learned it, which was an open procedure, to the way you did it at the very, very tail end of your residency, which was transitioning to a robot. Um, I don't, you don't know, when was the last time you did an open procedure? 2016. Okay. So, it would be almost unheard of today that a patient would have a prostatectomy that is done anything other than through a robot. Correct. What is different today in the surgical practice, uh, in your surgical practice than say four years ago? How has it evolved? What are you doing today to make that operation better? Yeah, lots of things. Um, and, you know, surgery is always this balance of maximal exposure so that you can see everything with minimal exposure to preserve all the structures around whenever you're removing, whether it's the heart, the colon, the lung, whatever. And so prostate cancer surgery has evolved in a similar way. Historically, the robotic procedure was developed and really mimicked the open surgical procedure, which, which basically maximally exposed the prostate within the deep pelvis. It's in a very small tube. So for the tennis players out there, the deep pelvis is like the inside of a tennis ball you know, case, the kit where you get the three balls. It's very narrow, very small space. And you enter that space at the top of that case and you're operating at the bottom. That's why it's such a hard procedure to do. Now, we used to expose all the structures around the prostate to see it and delineate it from those structures. Um, we've the, the way that my technique has evolved is that now I maximally preserve all those structures around the prostate and basically operate in an even smaller hole. What do I mean by that? Well, there's fascia, which for the average listener is effectively like the Kevlar or the Gore-Tex of our entire body. It provides resiliency and strength to the structures. It keeps them in place. And the prostate is surrounded by a tremendous amount of fascia. And when fascia gets really, really thick, we refer to that as a ligament or a tendon. So the prostate has a fascia, it has a ligaments, and they support the prostate in the deep pelvis. And we historically, open and robotically, always would open up and disassemble that fascia, take it apart to expose the prostate, and then we would just sew it back together and hope that people were okay. We would preserve the structures around the prostate, but we'd hope they were okay. Since that time, we now have evolved, not just me, but you know, I think the elite prostate surgeons in the world and the country have developed techniques to do pelvic fascial sparing surgery, leaving all the fascia that surrounds the prostate, top, bottom, right, and left alone. And again, the purpose for this is not to enhance the removal of cancer. It's to mitigate the That's right. very real side effects yes. of the surgery, namely around erectile function and continence. Yes. So you have to always balance and weigh, are you getting all the cancer out? Because you can maximally preserve all these structures in the fascia and the tissues, but leave a lot of cancer behind. And then what's the point of the procedure? So you're always balancing your outcomes functionally with your outcomes from a cancer control perspective. So they- And a hundred years ago, getting all the cancer out was doable. The problem is the morbidity of the operation was, I mean, you were guaranteed to be incontinent yeah. and impotent. Yes, I would say 60 years ago, that was the case. 100 years ago, we could 
we could we were we were not picking up early enough anyway. Yeah. But remember, 100 years ago or 100 plus years ago, the first prostatectomy was a pelvic fascial sparing prostatectomy it because it because it was done retroperitoneal. It was, retroperitone- or it it was, was done. The it was done in the perineum where yeah. all of the fascia that supports the prostate was left in place. Yeah. It's just that no one had. It was bloody. You couldn't see what you're doing. So the robot enables you to have no bleeding. It enables you to see what you're doing and very, And remind very well. us just where the ports are. Where do you gain access? Yeah, you gain access to the prostate typically through um, the abdominal compartment. So you have, a, you have a central port at the belly button and then typically a couple ports around the, at the level of the belly button, more lateral to it, that you insert your instrumentation. Usually the procedure is done transperitoneally, meaning you put the ports into the peritoneum where the intestines live. And then you kind of exit the peritoneum and you do the procedure extra peritoneally outside of the peritoneum. Outside of the peritoneum and the deep pelvis is where all the fascia is there supporting the prostate and the structures around it. So now when I do the procedure, I do pe- pelvic fascial sparing. I've been doing it for two and a half years now. And that has, when I look at my results, I have not impacted at all my cancer control. So some of the early surgeons who did pelvic fascial sparing, they left a lot of cancer behind. You don't want to do that. That's the whole point of the procedure. When I track my, my data, I am able to have excellent cancer control numbers or data, margin rates, et cetera, whilst maximally preserving the structures around the prostate. So as we mentioned before, you have your orange. The pulp of the orange is not cancer, but the outer peel is cancer. And just adjacent to that outer peel are nerves for erectile function, nerves for you know, innervation of the urethral sphincter and the urethral sphincter itself. All of those structures are supported by pelvic fascia. We now leave all those structures in place and do the mm-hmm. procedure through an even smaller space. Requires a learning curve to, to adapt to it. But with that approach, you can really effectively eliminate urinary incontinence in almost everybody. And more importantly, the, 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 the rapidity with which urinary control comes back is outstanding. So, so what do you tell a patient today? I tell the patients my data. So I tell them that um, there's about a 4 to 5% chance that if we do your procedure, you, you know, you'd have a positive margin if the cancer is contained within the prostate, which is what I was doing beforehand. Okay. I tell the patients. So meaning, meaning there's a 95 to 96% chance that this operation will be successful from a cancer perspective, four to five percent chance we'd have to go back in to get some of the cancer out? I tell patients that it's a little bit more subtle than that. So a measure of surgical skill is are you taking out the prostate and all the prostate cancer if the cancer is contained within the prostate, right? Because you can see the prostate, you should take it out. So about four to five percent of the time, I make a little nick or I poke a little hole in the side of the prostate and expose some cancer. It doesn't mm. mean that they're going to have a recurrence, yep. but it's a sign of technical skill. An average, in an average you know, surgical series, is more like 15 or 20%. So we do a good job. Then I tell patients it's 55% chance that when I take your catheter out after the procedure, which is around 10 days, that you'll be dry, no leakage. I tell them that at one month, it's a 66% chance you'll be dry with no leakage. And at three months and your first kind of in-person follow-up, 95% chance you'll be dry, no leakage. Wow. Okay. Now, when we're doing that, I always tell patients that's no leakage, but you can still wear a pad or liner a day because people will often just do that for insurance or for protection. So that's what anterior fascial sparing surgery has done. It's what tra- about on erectile function? Yeah, it's transformed that space, urinary recovery, substantially. Now, when you do anterior fascial sparing, you can also potentially less, you know, you can damage the nerve tissue less <clears throat> when you do it, meaning you're not just fully moving it and dissecting it free. You kind of can leave it in situ. It kind of stays attached to the rectum and the mm. fascia around it. There's still neural trauma, and the biggest hurdle that we have in urology and in neurologic oncology is really optimizing our neural preservation. So we really are reliant on our neuroscientists to help us find those neuroprotective agents that we could deliver pre-surgery to mm. minimize that trauma. The nerves that we use that are, are utilized for erection are unmyelinated, and they don't really exist in a cable or bundle. They're kind of individual nerve fibers, so they're very sensitive to stretch, pulling and tugging. So that's what I explained to people. Now, the 
likelihood or probability that people would recover erectile function is much better when you do anterior fascial or pelvic fascial sparing surgery. But overall, the probability that they recover erectile function is highly dependent on the Gleason score, i.e. the aggressiveness of the tumor and the extent of the tumor. Because if you have a high-grade prostate cancer, there's a 60 to 80% chance that that cancer is growing into the nerve tissue on the side that the tumor exists on already. So we don't often think in absolutes like 100% resection of nerve yeah. or 0% resection of nerve, but we have to titrate the dissection surgically to incorporate any potential nerve tissue that may have cancer in it. The nice thing and the exciting thing is that we are moving into a space where there are going to be imaging agents in real time. So think about PET PSMA. There are now linking PET PSMA to near infrared based tracers. So you can actually flip a switch and do near infrared imaging hmm. in real time during a prostatectomy to look for residual cancer maybe. So if you maximally nerve spare, you can look at the tumor and look at the nerve and say, hey, is there any tumor left behind? So lots of things that are evolving in surgery that will help advance us in identifying precisely where the tumor is and where it is not, which are gonna be, you know, those, those trials are kind of evolving and starting soon, which will be really exciting stuff. So if a Gleason three plus four patient comes into you and you're, you, you know, it's a high enough four that you're gonna operate on him, yeah. what are you telling him is his, uh, on Cialis erectile, because I assume most of these patients will be on Cialis yeah. postoperatively. Age of the patient. Yeah. So, what's your sexual function before you start the so procedure? So, sixty-five-year-old guy who doesn't even require Cialis before surgery. Yeah, I would tell him it's a sixty-five to seventy-five percent chance to recover erection sufficient for intercourse with Cialis on board. Within how long? Twenty-four months. Okay. Because that neuropraxia is a 24 to 30 month process. Wow, so for the guys who don't get it back, they're gonna be looking at other therapies for yes. erectile function pumps and things of that nature. Well, there's uh, injectable medications, yep. so prostaglandins, they're very effective. They bypass the nerves yep. um, and or implantable devices. Okay, now 65 year old guy who's on Cialis before surgery, what's his recovery on Cialis? It's going to be 10 or 20% less good. Okay. Same guy, but he's a Gleason 4 plus 4. It depends on where the tumor is. Okay. So, so the nerve bundles are in the kind of posterior lateral portions of the prostate. Let's, let's think about like 5 and 7 o'clock, mm -hmm. the bulk of them. So if you have an anterior tumor at 1 o'clock, then we can do full nerve sparing. So this is the kind of nuance that, of again, subtly. comes into yes. the... the the, the diagnosis yes. prehend, yeah. So the prostaglandins have also been a game changer here because it sort of lessens the 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 the, the need for yep. perfect uh, recovery of erectile function postoperative. Well, we use prostaglandins and injectable medication in that kind of one to two or you know two year period of time where the nerve function is recovering because. And this is an injection at the base of the penis, yes. right at the vascular bundle, at the base of the penis into the cavernosal right body, right into the cavernos. Yeah. Okay. And that will trigger uh, uh, an erection, uh, which and is great. And what prevents that patient from getting priapism? The dosage of the medication. So you start out low and you titrate high. Got it. So that, you know, reoxygenates the penis, helps maintain penile length. Um, if you're attempting intercourse, uh, it would prevent any kind of potential microfracture like you had talked about with Mokira with with um, you know, with potential scarring and, and plaque formation. So, uh, I mean, I, I strongly advocate for it um, for all the patients. It helps with their recovery and helps them with their sexual, you know, function, sexual activity. In the meantime, so I mean, obviously, a lot of people listen to this podcast, and some of them at some point in their lives are going to maybe require prostate surgery. Not everybody can come to see you. Um, what are the questions that they should be asking their urologists as they're considering prostatectomy for cancer? Yeah, a lot of key points we talked about through the whole thing. So when the urologist, you know, did their biopsy, did he do an MRI beforehand? Because that means he's just like up to date with modern medicine. Um, when the pathologist read the specimen, did they do things like percent pattern four? That means that the pathologist at that institution is up to date. 
And then frankly, you know, what is the urologist practice um, that's offering them a radical prostatectomy? I firmly believe, and there's strong data to suggest that if you are a prostatectomy only practice like mine, that you're dedicated to and focused and thinking about the operation and all the subtleties we've talked about over the last couple hours that are related to the surgical outcome. So if you're a jack of all trade, then I don't recommend that you go to that person for their prostatectomy. So when my patients have uh, kidney stones, um, I don't treat them. I send them to my partners because they do a better job. All I do is prostatectomy. So for me, it's what's the scope of your practice? Are you prostatectomy only or you do everything? Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're a prostate or, and, and then on top of that, what are your outcomes? So what's your surgical margin rate and what's your rate of recovery, uh, functional recovery yeah. and just understanding what that numbers are. Sometimes I tell people numbers that they're not happy with. I try to set appropriate expectations for them after their procedure. Um, but just by, you know, they'll say, well, like, that's not what my, you know, my physician told me. They'll, some physicians will say hundred percent chance of erectile recovery. Well, that's not accurate. So that just tells me that they're trying to oversell having the procedure with that particular person. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that there's maybe only a dozen people that are doing the fascial sparing procedure. Did I hear you correctly? Well, it's certainly is a limited number. I mean, it's always evolving in terms of how many people are out there doing it. There is a learning curve too. So when you're- And you did say, uh, you, off, we, we yesterday when you and I went for a yeah. ruck, you mentioned to me, it's added time to your procedure. It's a it's yeah. a harder procedure and it takes longer to do. Yeah, there's so, a new learning curve. So if you if you can do a prostatectomy, um, you can't just suddenly flip and do a fascial sparing. So what? How long did it take you to do it without fascial sparing, and how long does it take you now? It takes me about forty five minutes longer with fascial sparing. So my average surgical time was maybe ninety to one hundred and twenty minutes before, and I had forty five minutes yep. now. But you know, it's worth it um, to do that. We have a bunch of videos um, on our Northwestern Medicine Urology YouTube channel that show- We'll link to these as how well. How you can learn the procedure for those surgeons out there. Um, and then there's other approaches to doing anterior fascial sparing than the way, than my approach that I show, but th there, are, there are numerous videos for those as well. All right, one last question, Ted. Um, what are you most excited about in the next five years in the field of prostate cancer, and this could be anything from the diagnostics to the surgical treatment of, to the post-operative care and management of, any, anything. What, what are you most excited about? Integration of precision medicine. I've been passionate about and incorporated in my practice for over a decade, precision medicine. But like we talked about, understanding the molecular subtypes and phenotypes of an individual's tumor is going to be incredibly powerful and i think it's going to change how we think about and manage these individual patients not only recommending you know treatment for the localized disease like i think we're going to discover that they're exquisitely radiation sensitive tumors and those mm. that are radio resistant mm. and we know that there are exquisitely tumors that are exquisitely sensitive to androgens and those that are inherently androgen resistant and it's going to change. We've never, ever looked or thought about it before, but now we have in our hands the power to do that. And that's going to change everything, in my opinion. It's changing now, and we'll see the benefits of that those studies in the next five years. Awesome. Well, I think that means we'll probably have to sit down again in five years and talk <laughs> yeah, about sounds it. Sounds good. So. All right, Ted, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Peter. Thank you.